Council is please stand. Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare the meeting open and I remind all councillors of your obligations to declare material personal interest and conflict of interest where relevant and the requirement of such to remove yourself from the council chamber for debate and voting where applicable. Councillors, are there any apologies? There being no apologies, I will uh, move on. Confirmation of minutes, please. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,605th meeting held on Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Marks. The minutes of the 4,605th meeting of Council held on the 22nd of, 22nd of October 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, you are likely aware that we have some public participants today. I'd like to first call on Mr Peter Bonney, who will address the chamber on the Bright Paws Foundation, uh, assistant dogs for frontline personnel. And we have some guests with us today who'll be in the in the room. Welcome, Mr. Bonnie. Um, feel free to um, stand or sit, whichever is your preference, um, and you have five minutes beginning when you begin. Thank you. Welcome, and uh, Mr Chair, Lord Mayor and Councillors, uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to introduce the Bright Paws Foundation to you. And we thank you uh, for your very kind consideration in allowing us to introduce the Bright Paws Foundation and some very special people that have arrived you would have seen into chambers just a second ago. You know, it takes a community to support our valued community members, those members who are currently suffering from debilitating medical and mental issues, including mental disabilities, who need our respect and understanding to aid them in their future growth. Mental illness may not be a life sentence, but it is a lifelong struggle. Bright Paws Foundation has been set up and structured to facilitate the management and care of those frontline personnel who suffer from medical and mental trauma through the assistance dog and service dog programs. The use of dogs as assistance and service dogs is now well documented and is a valid and highly effective method to encourage and enhance the life of their human handler and to be an effective support ongoing, reducing reliance on medications and other support strategies. Our mission statement in brief is to effectively and efficiently utilise the power of the canine with the needs of their human handler to create a loving, respectful, long-term team with mutually beneficial outcomes in a world-class training environment, giving person purpose to living well. So please allow me to introduce the VIPs who you generously allowed to be here today. So the first, I'm going to get both Kelly Lodesmill and Daniel Mott to stand to introduce them. And both of them have their service dogs. Um, Kelly Lodesman is a co-founder, director and board meeting member of Bright Paws Foundation. She is a returned veteran of the Royal Australian Army with over 19 years of experience. And Daniel Mott is also a co-founder and director of Bright Paws, and he is a long-term serving Australian Army veteran with also many years of experience. Thank you both. Both Daniel and Kelly have a passion for supporting current or ex-frontline staff in the process of healing from quite debilitating uh, medical issues. They recognise the importance of service assistance dogs for their owners and were determined to offer support for all frontline staff or ex-frontline staff and not just for returned military veterans. 
Daniel and Kelly are board members, directors, and have taken on as many roles and put on as many hats as necessary to bring Bite Paws Foundation to where we are today. Wendy? Wendy Taylor was an Australian Army Nursing Corps ver veteran who served 24 years. Wendy was honorably discharged in 2005 and joined the RSL. Currently, uh, currently, Wendy is president of the RSL Southeastern District, which facilitates the Anzac Day Parade on behalf of the units and associations with that march. We are delighted to have the support that Wendy shows to Bright Paws and her active encouragement for us to continue to support all frontline or ex-frontline personnel from any discipline or job description, irrespective of position. Thank you very much for your attending here today. Uh, Kate. Kate Porcina is a 20-year policing veteran and currently a serving senior sergeant police officer in the Queensland Police Service, predominantly as a detective investigating child sex offences and colonial investigations. A former registered nurse and following her degree, she has attained a graduate diploma in health promotion and a master of suicidology. She is a daughter of a Vietnam vet, wife of an East Timor vet and a mother of teenage girls. All tough, huh? Um, <laughs> since the concept of Bright Paws began, Kate has been and continues to be an advocate of immense value to the community and the Bright Paws Foundation, supporting the police force personnel to get back into work during their recovery from medical and mental trauma. Barb Murphitt. Barb Murphitt is the junior vice president and a board member of Dogs Queensland and chair of the Queensland Dog Sports Committee. We are delighted to have Barb here with us today as her knowledge of all matters dogs is very highly regarded and respected by everyone in the dog world. Dogs Queensland has been and continues to support the Bright Paws Foundation in an active way. Access to the Dogs Queensland training grounds in Jurak is just one way they are supporting us. This association is seen as very important to Bright Paws in order to be a part of the world of dogs. Every person who has a dog and is part of the Bright Paws Foundation will be a member of Dogs Queensland. And this is just a small part of our holistic approach to great mental and physical health, as Dogs Queensland members can access a lot of service to encourage them to stay or get into the world of the world again. Thank you. And finally, I have one of our friends, uh, Tim Clark. Tim Clark has served in the ADF uh, for just under 26 years, including the Army and Air Force during that period. Tim had multiple operational deployments in Iraq, East Timor and Afghanistan. Recently, Tim has had multiple medical issues and having an assistance dog has provided many benefits for him and his family. Thank you for joining us, Tim. You're a real hero for Peter, us. Uh, Peter. I'm going to have to you. say that, is, that it's your time you. has expired. Um, but thank you for coming. I will now call on Councillor Maddock to respond. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and, and thank you, Mr Bonney, and uh, all of our guests in attendance uh, this afternoon. Uh, we really appreciate you coming in and the uh, amazing work that you do in this role with Bright Paws, but also your your contribution to community and your service is truly inspiring and outstanding. Um, Mr. Bonnie, thank you so much. I, um, I'm really pleased uh, for the opportunity to uh, have a conversation with you about the kind of outcomes that you'd like to seek. I know that um, the work you're doing is so vitally important and that the roles of all of these dogs uh, has such a key role to play in supporting uh, veterans, first responders, uh, frontline medical staff, and. Um, and, and that role uh, varies from that, uh, you know, from need to need, but but they are there to support them in so many ways, particularly dealing with the kind of trauma and the PTSD issues, but the things they see that they have to put up with. And uh, and I, I know from speaking to other veterans and other frontline uh, service providers how how challenging that can be at times. Um, I know that uh, at the moment you're you're looking for a home uh, and trying to work with council around an appropriate facility. Um, I know that, uh, for example, there was the opportunity for you to have a look at Cannon Hill, but for various issues that wasn't suitable for you. Uh, but we, we are, we, we, I think we have a, a few more locations coming up uh, in the short term uh, that we'll be going out to. Uh, I know that your organisation is registered for those uh, and, uh, and hopefully somewhere in there we can find an opportunity for you um, through that tender process. Uh, but I'd certainly uh, welcome the opportunity for yourself or your representatives 
uh, to meet with officers to have a, a look at what, what else might be out there um, and also how we might be able to assist uh, in the shorter and longer term as well. So thank you very much for your attendance today, sir, and uh, to all of you here, thank you very much for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Bonney. Um, Mr Pearce will show you out, but can I just ask, as you leave, this camera here will pick you up. So can you just, as you bring your dogs through, just, just draw them to face this camera here so that everyone can have, so that everybody can have a proper look at these wonderful animals that you brought into the room today? Yeah, please, and just go through here. Right. Councillors, we have a second public speaker today as well, and Ms Ruthie Adams, uh, representing the Zonta Club. Uh, Ms Adams. Ms Adams, I should say. Uh, welcome, Ms Adams. Um, now, councillors, you should have on your desk a piece of paper that looks like this that has been provided by uh, Ms Adams and Zonta. That's part of our presentation today. Uh, uh, Ms Adams, when uh, you are ready, please proceed. You'll have five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr Chair, Lord Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for the warm welcome and opportunity to address Council today. Zonta is a global organisation and we turn 100 years old on the 8th of November 2019, not me particularly. 100 years ago, five women in Buffalo, New York developed a vision, a vision to empower women through service and advocacy. Now there are 30,000 volunteers in 63 countries around the world working on local and international projects. Our focus on our vision keeps Zonta at the cutting edge. We don't dilute our messages. To achieve our goals, we need to continue to attract influential supporters and sponsors. As Vice President and recent past president of Zonta Northside, a small club of 11 members, I'd like to take this opportunity today to sincerely and publicly thank Amanda Cooper, former councillor for Brackenridge Ward, for her encouragement and support of Zonta Northside for the past three years. The community grants gave us several opportunities, including rebranding our club, updating our marketing tools, and purchasing advocacy icons. The grant also enabled us to grow our new breast care cushion project from 152 cushions to 400 per year to two hospitals. Zonta says no to violence against women. It's a seven-year-old international advocacy campaign. We already have 30 mini orange ladies, just like this one, in local businesses and schools that support our work. This new 2019 funding will enable us to purchase even more minis and share them with even more businesses and continue our breast care project. None of this would have been possible without the support of Amanda Cooper and her incredible Brisbane City Council Ward staff. But my grateful thanks, councillors, don't end there today. As chair of District 22 Queensland Centennial Celebrations, I'm honoured to report back on the Lord Mayor's initiative funding for a much bigger project. At our launch earlier this year, Lord Mayor announced funding for advocacy signage for backs of women's toilet doors like these, promoting emergency phone numbers to help women and girls at risk, vital information available in a safe place. I am delighted to report, Lord Mayor, that the signage is up in women's toilets throughout Brisbane City Council libraries, community halls and parks. This proactive initiative has also inspired others to become involved. 
It attracted influential investors and supporters, including Ben White, Brackenridge Tavern, a board member of the Queensland Hotels Association, who helped launch the project and his family pub with Amanda Cooper. Other supporters are of iconic pubs like the Caxton Hotel, the Port Office and Cha Cha Cha, to name just a few. In fact, the Queensland Hotels Association is running a feature about Ben and Zonta Northside in its December publication. Zonta is collaborative, and we shared our marketing artwork with Queensland and beyond. In fact, we rebranded Australia and New Zealand. The emergency signage is now being funded locally by mayors around Australia, with interest from USA and Europe just this week. It has the potential, this, made of credit card-like material, the potential to go global. As a pebble in a pond, one small club has been enabled to have a much bigger impact, and it all began with Brisbane City Council. Councillors, when the Brisbane landscape buildings and bridges are lit up orange on November 18, will you walk peacefully with Zonta through city streets? Will you walk with women like me, survivors of dreadful domestic violence? Will you join us and say Brisbane City Council and Zonta say no to any violence against women and girls? Will you walk with me, Mr Chair, Lord Mayor and councillors? Thank you for the opportunity to report back to you today on the outcomes of your generosity and thank you for your ongoing support of Zonta Northside. Thank you. All right, I will now call on <coughs> Councillor Allen to respond. <coughs> thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Ms Adams, for uh, coming in and addressing the chamber today. It's, uh, Certainly uh, an inspiring story what Zonta is doing, both domestically and internationally, and at the risk of perhaps just expanding on some of the points you made earlier um, for the benefit of the Chamber. Uh, Zonta, as uh, Ms Adams has pointed out, has been in existence for uh, 100 years and started from quite humble beginnings in New York uh, with the, uh, the objective of five women to bring equality for women. Within a very short period of time, that group of five had grown to 600 in the United States, I think roughly a year, and Zonta is now present in nearly 70 countries and approaching 35,000 members, so clearly things have moved on a lot over the last decade. Locally, I understand the Zonta Club of Brisbane was established in 1971 and it's now recognised or described as uh, Division 22 and it has more than 1,000 members across northern New South Wales and Queensland, and I'm uh, proud to say that my late mother was also a member of Zonta in years gone by. Everyone involved with Zonta should be proud of everything they've achieved and everything they do daily to eliminate and minimise domestic and family violence. Zonta has played an important role in impro improving legal, political, economic, health and the professional status of women. As you mentioned, one focus of Zonta locally has been the Zonta Says No to Violence campaign against women. The campaign, campaign ties in with the UN's Unite to End Violence Against Women campaign, which has designated the 25th of each month as Orange Day, and I see you uh, in orange there today. Perhaps I've been remiss, Councillor Toomey has an orange tie, which is great to see. Uh, and this raises awareness and takes action to prevent uh, violence against women and children. I also understand that Zonta clubs are encouraging their member groups to have orange events during the period from the 25th of November to the 10th of December to promote this worthy objective. In support of Zonta Says No campaign, Brisbane City Council will be lighting up both the Story and Victoria Bridges in orange from the 18th to the 19th of November and will be lighting the Tropical Dome at Mount Cutha from the 18th to the 23rd of November. In fact, I understand the whole city will have an orange tinge to it during this period with the Karilpa Bridge, Treasury Casino and Sulio Helsha Bridge, better known as the Gateway Bridge, also lit up in orange. Brisbane City Hall will also display an orange silhouette in the foyer on the 18th of November. 
I also took the opportunity to check out the uh, District 22 website earlier, and I understand you'll be running a series of events to support this particular campaign. Everyone in this chamber, and indeed Brisbane City Council as an organisation, is very much in support of what you're trying to achieve. As you may be aware, Council is currently in the process of preparing a domestic and family violence prevention strategy. We have been spending a fair bit of time over the past few months ensuring that we undertake our due diligence, review relevant research, listen to and speak to bodies such as yours, and identify the role that Council can play in advocating and reducing domestic and family violence. Already, Council does quite a lot to ensure that people who are impacted by domestic and family violence can be supported. As the District 22's own event to celebrate 100 years of Zonta, I know the former Lord Mayor Graham Quirk attended the event and announced the Council was able to partner with Zonta to deliver a new initiative, which you've touched upon, and I think uh, they're just fantastic. They are a great assistance to people who perhaps don't know what the points of contact are if they're in this situation, and it's fantastic to hear that this particular application, which was conceived here in Brisbane, now has the potential to be applied globally. And I think that's a great credit to your group. So this year will be a, a big year for, for Zonta, and obviously you're the uh, chair of the 100-year uh, the celebration event, so uh, we would certainly be very keen to walk with you and support you uh, on that event. Um, I know that the Lord Mayor Adrian Schrenner met recently with Dr Suzanne von Basewitz, uh, who is the international president of Zonta, and uh, certainly I think that that signifies how importantly we take the work of Zonta, particularly in this city, but also uh, more broadly internationally. So, uh, in conclusion, I'm very keen to continue to hear about the work that Zonta is doing, to hear of new initiatives like the one you've raised today, and thank you very much for coming into the chamber and giving us that update. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Adams. Councillors, I draw your attention to question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a Chair of any standing committee? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, over the weekend it was revealed that Council is undertaking major awareness campaigns to boost tourism in Brisbane and drive the local economy. Can you outline how this administration is ensuring the Brisbane of tomorrow is better than the Brisbane of today? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Toomey, for the question. We discovered, um, to everyone's dismay, just recently that under this state government, Queensland has the worst unemployment rate in the nation. The worst unemployment rate in the nation, 6.6 per cent. And if you compare it to Victoria and New South Wales, Victoria has a uh, 4.8 per cent unemployment rate and New South Wales a 4.5 per cent unemployment rate, and we have 6.6 per cent. Uh, and that is something that should motivate all of us uh, going forward to make sure that we are working to do what we can as a council uh, to pick up the slack from the state government. The state government obviously thinks that they can employ all of those unemployed people as public servants, and they've increased the number of public servants by something like $3 billion a year. <laughs> They're spending an extra $3 billion on public servants each year. And guess what? Despite that, despite that, the unemployment rate is still 6.6%. And so Labor just doesn't get that you can't solve every problem by employing extra public servants. Uh, you've actually got to build infrastructure. You've got to support local business. You've got to support tourism. And these are the types of things we're doing as an administration, an administration that has consistently delivered balanced budgets year after year after year so that we can invest in infrastructure 
and we can invest in initiatives that support local residents and support business and support tourism in our city. And so we are very proud to be uh, embarking on a campaign to bring more people uh, into Brisbane, bring more people from other parts of Australia, and also to support our local businesses and to support our local residents. And so we've launched major campaigns uh, to do exactly those things. First of all, uh, we have a, uh, an initiative that we're launching to support tourism visitation into Brisbane. And we have so much to see and do here and anyone that's come from other parts of Australia and seen Brisbane in recent years knows just how fantastic it is and they want to come back and they want to tell their friends and family about it. Uh, and Brisbane residents know what a gem that we have here. But we've got to get the message out and it is something that we're doing with a $2 million campaign uh, to promote Brisbane and also to support visitation. And that'll be moving into other uh, capital cities in Australia going forward as well, places like Sydney and Melbourne and Adelaide. Uh, and that is really important because we just recently saw a tourism strategy released by this council. And the one thing that really stuck in my mind is that by getting visitors to stay an extra night or an extra day, we can add billions of dollars to the local economy. And that will support local business, that will support jobs, that will create real jobs that doesn't come at a major burden to the taxpayer like employing more public servants. And so uh, this is where the smart money is. And we, we see that Labor is all about employing more public servants, not about supporting tourism and not about building infrastructure. The, op the leader of the opposition is interjecting uh, and suggesting that all of those extra staff are somehow nurses and teachers. Uh, yeah, rubbish. They're all cramming into one William Street up there in the Tower of Power. They're all ministerial advisers. They're all, they're all policy hacks. Uh, we know that that's where Labor puts the money. And you only have to look at the big blowouts in uh, ministerial Councilor, budgets okay, to see Councilor, where the money stop, is going. Stop. Yeah. Okay, both of you. Councillor Cassidy, Councillor Murphy, both of you will stop interjecting. Councillor Cassidy, I direct you to stop interjecting now. Lord Mayor, please continue. Thank you. Uh, so we believe in supporting tourism, which helps create jobs for local people uh, and which helps, which helps local business and local residents. Because if small business, if local business is doing well, then they're creating economic opportunities for Brisbane residents. And that's how you grow a sustainable economy. Uh, and you invest in infrastructure as well. That is exactly what we're doing as a council, what we will continue to do going forward. But importantly, because we've managed to run balanced budgets year after year after year, and we've managed the budgets responsibly, we have the funding available to Point introduce order, initiatives. Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. I'm having trouble hearing the mayor due to interjections in the chamber. Thank you, Councillor Shree. I agree with you. I've asked councillors to remain silent through the answer. I have directed some councillors to cease their interjecting. Answers will be heard in silence. Lord Mayor, you have 30, and also, can all members of the public gallery please keep your seats? Lord Mayor, you have 33 seconds. Uh, thank you. And that's why responsible economic management is why we've been able to deliver a free seniors off-peak travel program, which is seeing more people getting out and about, and not only just taking advantage of the free travel, but getting out experiencing the city and also supporting local business at the same time. We've been able to introduce the 50 per cent rate discount for first home buyers, fee reductions for local business, uh, and also we're getting on with major projects like Brisbane Metro, the Victoria Park Vision, building new bridges, the Lord infrastructure Mayor, that our city no expired. needs to create jobs. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, you have repeatedly stated in public that you have spent your $100,000 ratepayer funded cash payments on the same things that previous Lord Mayors have spent theirs on. So, with that in mind, Lord Mayor, can you tell us what Graham Quirk and Campbell Newman spent their $1 million plus cash payments on over their 16 years in office, just to give the people of Brisbane some idea? Lord Mayor. I hear Councillor Cumming piping up, Mr Chair. I wonder what he spent his allowance on. I wonder what he spent his allowance on. I didn't see him coming forward. Uh, but what I can say is this. Labor is obsessed 
with their own salaries and allowances. And these are the guys that want to set the salaries and allowances. They want to get their hands in the cookie jar and they want to dial it up and dial it down for political purposes. And, and you know what? We are the proud administration that brought into this place an independent right remuneration tribunal. They are the appropriate people to make decisions on these matters, which, why, which is why we have given them the terms of reference and why they are doing a review right now. And so I think what we need to do now is to let them do their job, and I won't be commenting further on these matters. Further questions? Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin, in the coming weeks, Council will be completing a number of road upgrade commitments from the 2016 election. Can you update the Chamber on how the Shina administration is delivering for the residents of Brisbane and getting them home quicker and safer? Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you to Councillor Huang for that very timely question from you. Um, Mr Chair, this council delivers projects that tackle congestion and get residents home quicker and safer. And through TransApex, this council has delivered more than $7 billion worth of infrastructure projects. This, I believe, is the largest combination of infrastructure projects ever delivered in Australia by a council. Connecting Brisbane, released by the state government and the council, highlighted the prediction of both Infrastructure Australia and the Bureau of Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Economics that the cost of road congestion will more than double to between four and nearly six billion dollars for Brisbane and nine billion dollars for South East Queensland by 2030 if congestion is not tackled. Page 14 of this report connecting Brisbane. This is why, Mr Chair, this council is getting on with the delivery of projects that tackle congestion and improve safety, like for Wynnum Road like for Kingsford Smith Drive, Murphy and Ellison Road, and through the public transport investment like Brisbane Metro. And I was very interested to read in this connecting Brisbane document uh, a statement by the Deputy Premier, uh, Jackie Trad, and uh, the then Lord Mayor, Graham Quirk. Uh, and I quote from that document, Brisbane is long overdue for a transformation of its public transport network, including the creation of the vital and complementary Cross River Rail and the Brisbane Metro to prevent critical bottlenecks to our economy. And wouldn't it be fantastic if the state government got on with its job and allowed that project, that crucial uh, Brisbane Metro project, to proceed? Um, Mr Chair, I'm very pleased to provide an update to the Chamber on upgrades that have just been delivered and will be delivered in the coming weeks. Investments uh, by, the, by Team Schrinner to get residents home quicker and sooner. Councillor Huang, I know you're particularly interested in the works at Player Street at Upper Mount Gravatt. Uh, Player Street Upper Mount Gravatt is a great example of a project uh, from which all Southsiders will soon be benefiting. Council tried to work with the state government uh, to deliver this project together, but in the end had to fully fund this upgrade, despite the massive benefit to the state. Stop. Councillor McLaughlin, please stop. Please allow the councillors to answer their questions in silence. Uh, no. Did, when I ask you for silence, that's not an invitation to interject. Thank you, Mr Chair. Council tried to work with the state government to deliver this project together, but in the end had to fully fund this upgrade, despite the massive benefit to the state government's network. Um, an outcome of the 2012 Mount Gravatt Corridor Neighbourhood Plan, the work at Player Street will improve connectivity, safety and traffic flows for all road users for the Kessels Road, Cremon Street and Kessels Road, McGregor Street, Upper Mount Gravatt, Garden City, Shopping Centre, Access Road intersections. So all those intersections do benefit from this crucial work. Southsiders have told me that uh, significant congestion occurs on Kessels Road, especially adjacent to the Garden City Shopping Centre. Uh, Kessels Road, as we know, is a state controlled road and forms part of the Brisbane Urban Corridor, a corridor with more than 40,000 vehicle movements on average each day. Between 2017 and this year, the Queensland Police Service recorded more than 150 recorded accidents on Kessels Road through the intersection of McGregor Street, Cremon Street and Logan Road. Between 1,700 and 2,400 vehicles travel this section of Kessels Road per hour in the morning and afternoon peak periods currently, with 10% of all vehicles on Kessels Road are designated as heavy vehicles. 
Council's traffic modelling indicates the current layout of the road network will not accom accommodate future traffic demands by 2031. Forecast delays of approximately five and seven minutes for Cremon Street, making right-hand turns from McGregor Street, uh, respectively. So Council planning predicts that this upgrade will prevent up to 75 per cent of crashes for Kessels Road and Cremon Street. Um, this week, the lights will be turned on for residents to be able to use this particular intersection upgrade. Councillor Huang, I know that you will be there, ready to see this historic event. Uh, Mr Chair, just quickly some other projects that fall under the ambit of these, uh, con uh, these upgrades. The Umong Street and River Hills Road at Middle Park, a uh, fantastic project. Um, and following Council's extensive investigations, Council has delivered in the last two weeks an upgrade to a roundabout that I'm sure southwestern suburbs are enjoying to uh, get a quicker and safer journey home. And the last one I want to conclude with is the great work being undertaken in Councillor Allen's ward at Widdop Street at the Toomble Shopping Centre intersection. Uh, a fantastic safety upgrade at the traffic light, uh, well, to provide traffic lights at that intersection. Uh, as Northsiders know only too well, a safety issue and a congestion issue that is being fixed by the installation of traffic lights at this intersection. Your time's expired. Thank you, Mr Chair. Councillor Johnston. Yes, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, recently the state government wrote to uh, UN Council seeking advice about Council's road plans for the low rail bridge separating Sherwood and Corinda. Will Council be providing this critical information and working cooperatively with the state government to progress this essential widening project? Lord Mayor. Thank you for the question, Councillor Johnston. Uh, well, look, I, I can say that our record shows very clearly that we do work cooperatively with the state government, and we wouldn't have had more than 300 meetings on Brisbane Metro if we didn't want to work with them and we weren't willing to cooperate. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yes, my question is about uh, the low rail bridge separating Sherwood and Corinda, not the Brisbane Metro. Uh, and Lord I was Mayor, answering no, that Lord question. Mayor, please yeah. continue. You've got four minutes and 40 <laughs> seconds to go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we're always willing to cooperate with uh, other levels of government that want to build infrastructure. Um, but we always expect them to actually do their fair share as well. Um, and uh, we know that uh, Minister Bailey is far more interested on occasions in playing politics than actually building anything. So I hope this is a good example of a different situation, but we will continue to work to deliver infrastructure that benefits the residents of Brisbane. And if uh, Minister Bailey has um, some real funding uh, to come to the table with, um, uh, and we're, help, uh, we're happy to work and provide information that will help him make that investment in the road network uh, and make Point that of order, investment in. Mr. Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, the standing orders uh, require the Lord Mayor to answer the question, um, and the uh, question was about whether Council would be providing the plans for the roadworks that the state have requested, and I'd appreciate it if the Lord Mayor could address the question. I, I don't actually recall the question They didn't say anything like about that. plans. I yeah. don't recall the question being of that nature. Yes. I'm more than happy to <laughs> repeat it for you, Mr Chairman. No, no need. State Government no recently need. wrote to Council Councilor seeking Johnston, advice about Council's road plans. Lord, Lord Mayor, please continue. <laughs> look, I, I don't know why I'm needed in this question. Um, look, Councillor Johnson just wants the grandstand, so she can do that. Um, I've answered the question. All right. Are there further questions? Councillor, <laughs> Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Public and Active Transport, Economic and Tourism Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor. I understand that this coming Friday, both yourself and the Lord Mayor will be meeting with Minister Bailey regarding the Brisbane Metro. Could you please outline to the Chamber what outcomes you are after from this meeting and the preparation taken to ensure an outcome is achieved? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Davis, and thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, quite a pertinent question, considering the last question we had about working with the state government. I know that all the councillors in the administration uh, side of the chamber are very keen on how this meeting is actually going to go on Friday. Despite all the hostility over the last past couple of months, we are encouraged that we can achieve just a little bit of cooperation from the state this week. Uh, the investigations on the different station options has been a major hindrance. But 
but the state have had all of that information since the 24th of September. We, in good faith, went away and did exactly what the minister asked us to do and passed that all on to him and his uh, officers to look at. The only thing holding us back now, of course, is the poor politicking that we're seeing with $944 million of public money that we have. At this point of time, there is absolutely no reason why the state cannot give us approvals to move forward with the Metro. We have jumped so many hoops over the past two years. We just heard the Lord Mayor mention again the many meetings, 276 before the changes well over 300 now, and it's not just council that will benefit this. It will also be the state. It's about the market stability. It's about making sure that the commuters of Brisbane will be one step closer to a turn up and go transport option. Uh, for the benefit of the chamber, on the 21st of June this year, the minister asked us to investigate those two alternative metro station options. We had been asking for that advice for over 10 months, and then suddenly, Three hours, I think, before the tenders were due, we got the guidance that we needed. Regardless, we went away. Three full months of work went into this. The option does cost $390 million more. What? Both have an increase in travel time and both have a major risk of flooding, requiring the installation of very large mechanical floodgates. But this is the final report that we gave to the minister on the 24th of September extended the invitation to meet so that I could brief him personally, absolutely declined. I get to tag along with the Lord Mayor, the Chair of Public and Active Transport, with the Minister on Monday. I'm not sure what he has against me, uh, Lord Mayor. I'll take your interjection. Um, they've had over a month now to provide their comments. We have had crickets, complete silence. But unfortunately, it is absolutely necessary that the state government approve our reference design station. They have refuted it. They've had a month. We are hoping on Friday that we will finally get a, de a decision. It would be a tragedy to build a major project like the Metro and have a 19 per cent travel time increase with these new stations rather than a time decrease. You don't build projects to actually inconvenience people. That is why the reference design is the base design that we need to start with and go into our detailed design. Queensland right now has the worst unemployment rate in the country. Shame. This state has 6.6 per cent unemployment. And projects like the Metro will not only help employment in the build, the design, the build, the getting it up and running, but the time savings for people to get to work, to get the productivity, to get us moving again. All we need to do is work together. We have worked together endlessly on the Cross River Rail. Albert Street is shut. We gave the permits for that. I hear the uh, from Councillor Griffiths on the other side. Never run a project in his life. Goodness help us if it ever came to that. We gave the permits for William Street to shut. We spent ten thousand dollars redoing lights into ten million dollars redoing intersections around the CBD to make it work. We have closed Albert Street with the permits. We have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars making sure the CBD still works. This is about making sure we can get the metro up and running. We support the Cross River Rail. Kate Jones, the new Cross River Rail minister, supports metro. We asked the Minister Bailey get on board. Minister Bailey, this helps his electorate as well. Probably his electorate more than any other electorate on the south side. But for some reason. I'm not quite sure. And now, of course, yesterday we see the Deputy Premier crying foul that, foul that Canberra wasn't back in Queensland. Well, they gave us $300 million for the Metro and the state won't let us get on with it. Yeah. Yeah. We need to build Metro right now. We cannot afford any more crafted delays like the integrity of the building at QPAC. The state government built a bus tunnel underneath City Hall. It can be done. We're not even going underneath QPAC in the reference design. I question whether the Deputy Mayor uh, has even uh, seen uh, the Deputy, reference design. Uh, Deputy Mayor, your time has expired. We, out wait, we wait the outcome of Councilor Friday. Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, will you please tell us exactly how much was budgeted for the first home owners remission program in this year's budget for the current financial year? Lord Mayor. Why don't you read the budget? Further questions? Councillor Richards. 
Um, my question is to the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Hammond. Councillor Hammond, in conjunction with the Oxley Creek Transformation Team, the Graceful Riverside Parklands Community Ideas Day will kick off next month, where Graceful residents will have the opportunity to provide their ideas on future parkland and playgrounds in the area. Can you outline how residents can get involved and contribute to a cleaner and greener Brisbane? Councillor Hammond. Can, okay, right. Please don't interject at all, but in particular, before a person even begins speaking. Eh? <laughs> Let's just allow them to say something first. Uh, Councillor Hammond, please thank proceed. Thank you for your protection, Mr Chair. Um, and I'd also like to thank Councillor Richards for the question. Although this is not in your ward, I know that you are very excited about this project because Oxley Creek Transformation is a fantastic project that will benefit the whole city. It's great to be here to announce to the Chamber that the Graceful Riverside Parkland Community Ideas Day is happening on Saturday, the 30th of November, from 12 no interjections. to 2. Councillor Johnston, I direct you to cease interjecting. Councillor Hammond, please continue. Mr Chair, it's always disappointing. She sits here and complains about not getting anything, and this is a massive project that is going to benefit the whole city Councillor Johnston, in her Councillor area. Councillor Johnston, I warn you that if you do not cease interject, uh, interjecting, I will formally warn you. Councillor Hammond, please continue. The community engagement exercise is intended to inspire and collect ideas from the community, as well as allow the community to vote on the ideas that the Oxley Creek transformation have generated for the parkland and playground. Oxley Creek transformation will also be engaging with the leaseholders, including Brisbane Canoeing, Graceville Rugby League Club, the Sea Scouts, and of course, the local councillor has been kept in the loop the whole way through this whole project since the beginning. The feedback received will then inform. <coughs> sorry, um, it will then um, inform and inspire the draft tennis and graceful precinct plan, um, which will be released to, for consultation in mid 2020. The tennis and graceful precinct plan program um, is one of 13 ideas for the Oxley Creek transformation plan. This precinct plan is intended to be planning the planning exercise that will explore the site's involvement, projects, activation opportunity, as well as environmental outcomes. Oxley Creek Transformation invite the whole community to come and have their say on the future of Graceville Riverside Parklands. This is just another way that Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner is creating more to do, see and do in this clean, green city. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, since being appointed by your LNP colleagues to sit in the Mayor's chair, you have now sent out over four million glossy brochures with your image on them. Do you have no shame? Lord. Well, I'm not sure. Um, Lord Mayor, I call on you to respond. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how to respond to that because that was a, that was a statement, a political statement, um, which we would expect, which we would expect. All right, from okay. this councillor, councillors, allow the Lord Mayor to respond. Which we would silence. expect from this unelected opposition leader, unelected opposition leader, and his and his unelected deputy. Um, but look, I, I just don't know why Labor is so obsessed with my face. I don't know why they are so obsessed with my face. I don't, it's just, you know, they, they, just have, they just have personal Councillor attacks Cassidy, and mud to throw I direct and you to nothing else to offer. Sorry, Lord Mayor, please stop. Councillor Cassidy, I direct you to cease interjecting, and if you do not comply with my, with my direction, you will be warned. Lord Mayor? All right. Further questions? Cunningham? Oh, Councillor Cunningham? My question is to the Chair of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee, Councillor Maddock. Okay, stop, Councillor Cunningham. Councillor Cassidy, I hereby warn you that unless you cease interjecting, you may be suspended for a period of up to eight days. Furthermore, Councillor Cassidy, if you are suspended, you must immediately leave the meeting place and must remain away from all meeting places for the period of the suspension. 
Councillor Cunningham, please continue your question. As I said, my question was to the Chair of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee, Councillor Maddock. Councillor Maddock, there are a number of pools being upgraded across Brisbane, ready for the upcoming summer season. Can you outline where these upgrades are occurring and how the Schrinner administration is giving residents more to see and do? Councillor Maddock. Thank you very much, Mr Chair, and I thank Councillor Cunningham for the question and the opportunity to talk about this very important issue and in, also to highlight um, the great legacy and the, the work that this side of the chamber is doing in upgrading pools as opposed to the ALP, whose legacy is about closing pools, Mr Chairman. Mr Chairman, uh, this administration, through its continued investment uh, through this term, has seen in the 2018-2019 period more than 3.3 million patrons, 587,000 children attending Learn to Swim lessons, and 169,000 concession pension patrons. And by, by being able to continue that strong investment, we, will con uh, we have seen a significant increase in patronage over the past four years. In fact, Mr Chairman, 46 per cent increase in patronage over the four years. This can only be achieved by the continual investment in our pools because they are such an essential part of our community and what Council delivers. And it goes to the core, uh, Mr Chairman, of this administration's commitment of more to see and do for Brisbane residents. By making sure that we do this, we are, as Councillor Cunningham was saying, uh, continuing to get ready for the upcoming summer season and being making sure that uh, we've got our pools in the perfect condition to meet those <coughs> needs. So we'll have um, more than 3.2 million residents, as I said before, visited in the last financial year. And that's because they love, uh, our residents love the opportunity to go out and uh, visit these centres and have different experiences. When speaking to residents across Brisbane, uh, many of us, uh, Mr Chair, often hear how people love to visit their local pools as they continue to be a place to meet, connect and play. You know, Brisbane has a wonderful climate and, uh, and a great outdoor lifestyle. And uh, by continuing our strong investment in that space each year, council pools are just one of the many ways that our residents' visitors can make the most of our enviable lifestyle. And as part of our commitment to create more for residents to see and do, we've incorporated aquatic playgrounds in 16 Brisbane pools, which provides hours of entertainment for children. Many of our pools also offer learn to swim programs, fitness centres, exercise classes and barbecues, and they are great and an affordable day out that the whole family can enjoy. Now, we've up, we have upgraded council pools across Brisbane to allow even more residents to enjoy these fantastic offerings. And we have just delivered a new 25 metre heated indoor pool, fitness centre, kiosk and entrance, uh, Im improved bathrooms, amenities, and the car park spaces at the Sandgate Aquatic <coughs> Centre. These improvements have made sure that the facility remains an enjoyable, modern and family friendly destination now and into the future. In addition to the Sandgate Aquatic Centre upgrades, other works are underway uh, and are almost completed at Balbowrie, Runcorn, and uh, significant works being undertaken at Langlands, and all are due to be completed in the coming months. Council will continue to deliver projects that bring neighbourhoods to life and make Brisbane the best place to live, work and relax, Mr Chairman. And by continuing this strong investment as we have within this term, we will continue to see even more uh, patronage increases, even more residents uh, satisfied with their experience at these pools, but importantly also continuing to provide those essential services uh, to residents around early, uh, early learning uh, swimming classes and also supporting our elderly residents through all the different fitness classes that people can enjoy. These facilities continue to be such an important part of our community as, and as we continue to enhance these services, we will see even more opportunities to come up. Our, our lessees are a vital part of our delivery outcome, uh, especially like in instances with Sandgate, where we can see experienced, long-term, uh, successful lessees continue to deliver even more for residents to see and do. And by being able to do that and by offering those variety of services, not only day to day, but importantly also during the summer period, during the holiday program, we will continue to see better outcomes. As I've said before, Mr Chairman, in this place, as a part of our summer campaigns, we're always expanding the program, making sure that there's even more for children to enjoy and, and people of all ages, because those pools are such a vital hub. Mr Chairman, again, this administration continues its strong commitment to investing in our pools, making sure that we deliver on those outcomes, 
Unlike those opposite in the dark history, uh, Mr Chairman, where they closed Toowong Pool because it was a maintenance nightmare and for them in their terms, and they didn't want to invest in it because they felt there were low patronage numbers. But as you can clearly see, Mr Chairman, if you invest in our local pools, you will increase patronage. I remember a time when Councillor Maygub was the Councillor of Toowong Ward, standing there with residents, trying to defend against Councillor Hinchliffe and Lord Mayor Sawley at the time, their decision to try and close that pool down and sell it off. Mr Chairman, yet uh, Councillor uh, Magub and the community tried to fight the best they could to get the kind of outcomes they needed for Council to do its job, to upgrade those pools, to continue to deliver those services. Councillor this Maddox, administration will continue to do that. Are there further questions? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. My question is to the Mayor. Lord Mayor, are you confident that in high growth suburbs such as West End, South Brisbane, Woolloongabba and Kangaroo Point, that there is enough usable public green space to cater for existing residents and those of new apartments already under construction. Uh, is your message to residents who complain about inadequate green space that they are wrong? Uh, Lord Mayor. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the question. I, uh, I am confident that uh, when people think about parkland, they don't ever think that there's a square meterage of parkland that comes into mind where, when they choose to live in an area. Um, that's not the way people look at parkland, because I know, uh, I know plenty of examples of where a very small area of parkland um, is used to its best ability and has great use and a great benefit to the community. And I know plenty of areas where there's massive open fields of parkland that are hardly used. Now, that doesn't mean um, that more shouldn't be done to make sure they're used, and that's a big part of what we're doing as an administration, creating more parkland, but also taking what we've got and upgrading it, taking opportunities like Victoria Park, council land, making it more accessible to people and more usable. But if Councillor Shree thinks that there's some kind of square meterage per person that uh, is the magic formula for this, um, then that's not how the real world operates. And that, that's not how people choose to live in particular parts of Brisbane. Because uh, point there point is- Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Is the mayor under, unaware of the desired standards of service? I'm, I'm concerned he's misleading the chamber when there is actually a square meter formula in the city um, plan. Thank you, Councillor Shree. I'll, I'll take that as a comment. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Councillor Shree. And, and of course, there, of course there are uh, standards that we like to achieve, but that's not what the community sees, and that's not how the community views this. And as I said, uh, a particular park of a particular size in one area can be really well used and activated, and the same size park somewhere else um, may not have the same use. Uh, and different sizes of parkland uh, can achieve uh, similar outcomes if you uh, plan them well and if you activate them well. Uh, but I'm simply pointing out that when someone moves into an area, they don't get out the measuring tape and say, oh, you know what, um, there's 10 square metres less parkland here than they should be. I think everyone in every part of Brisbane can agree that increasing parkland is a good thing. And that's why we've got the Green Future Fund and that's why we've got the local government infrastructure plan that has plans for hundreds of new and upgraded parks right across the city. And that's why we do neighbourhood plans and we talk about uh, the community's aspirations to have better and improved parks. And that's why we've got parks like the Milton Urban Common Point of order, that Mr. have Chair. been under construction. Point of order, Councillor Shree. On relevance, my question was specifically about South Brisbane, West End, Woolloongabba. Oh, I didn't inter I interpreted it as... as as a, a question regarding, because you asked two questions, and they were questions regarding um, the ratios of parkland to people, Lord Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, look, I, what I what I can say is that um, the area, the type of areas that um, Councillor Shree was referring to, uh, have some of the most well-used and popular parklands in the city, um, and you know, from a public point of view. People come from all over to, to use those parks, and those parks are available for local residents to use. They are iconic parks of an incredibly high standard, um, and, and certainly much higher than people in other parts of Brisbane would benefit from. Uh, and so, 
I would simply say that the question is a little bit too simplistic um, because it puts it down to a square meterage, and and I don't think that that's how um, the residents of Brisbane view their parks. We agree that there needs to be more investment in parks, which is why we've set up the Green Future Fund. That's why we have projects funded uh, each year in the budget through various means, such as, such as through the LGIP and also through the general parks funding that we provide each year. And we are putting record amounts into parkland, whether it's buying new parkland or upgrading parkland. And I, men I mentioned the Milton Urban Common, which is a new park that has been created in a very growing area in Councillor Maddox area uh, in Milton. And it's just one of many examples of where we're uh, building and creating new parkland. And, and on a regular basis, I get the opportunity to uh, go past the Carl Street Park at Baranda, which I know in, par in the past was um, some very old buildings which have now been removed, purchased by council and turned into parkland. And we're in the process of making sure we activate that park as well. There are many examples right across the city where we are building and or buying land for parkland and building and creating new parks. But there are also many more examples of where we're taking existing parks and activating them, upgrading the facilities to make sure they're more usable for the community. And so um, I'm not sure what world Councillor Shree lives in, but the world that he lives in is different to the world residents live in, where uh, they have a look at an area that they want to move into, and they have a look at things like the parkland in the area, and they decide whether they want to live in a Lord particular Mayor, part of your Brisbane. Your time has expired. Further questions? Councillor Marks. Thank you. My question is to the Chair, Field Services Committee, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, can you please update the Chamber on this administration's commitment to deliver 2,000 road resurfacing projects over this term? Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I thank Councillor Marks for the question. This administration is committed to getting residents home quicker and safer by delivering smoother suburban streets. And that's why this administration committed to spending a record $360 million this term for resurfacing our roads. This means 2,000 streets and roads will be resurfaced this term. And it's the largest resurfacing investment in Brisbane's history. Coun Councillor Johnston, please allow the answer to be heard in silence. Councillor Howard. In 2016, this administration made a commitment to invest a minimum of $5 million into resurfacing works in each of the city's 26 wards, and we're already on track to exceed this. I'm pleased to report that Council has already delivered over 1,800 resurfacing projects as part of this commitment, far ahead of the schedule. What's important but never gets highlighted enough, Chair, is that we are doing this in an environmentally friendly and sustainable manner as well. Council's commitment to creating a clean and green Brisbane continues, with tens of thousands of tonnes of materials being recycled to create new and improved roads across the city every year. Council's award-winning asphalt recycling program is leading the industry, with 20 per cent of material used in Council road resurfacing projects being recycled from old asphalt, old kerbs and footpaths and glass. And so as part of this award-winning program, last year Council recycled more than 60,000 tonnes of asphalt from our road network last financial year alone. To give you an idea of how amazing this achievement is, that's enough asphalt to lay over 100 kilometres of road. But that's not all, Mr Chair. Last year we used more than 5,000 tonnes of crushed recycled glass in our roads that was recrushed and graded before being delivered to Council's Eagle Farm and Riverview asphalt plants for reuse. That's the equivalent of more than 25 million beer bottles that have been recycled and put to good use by building smoother suburban streets to get residents home quicker and safer. Concrete from Council curb and channel and footpaths is also recycled back into construction materials for re reuse on our road network. Last year, over 25,000 tonnes, or the equivalent of 108 kilometres of footpath, was recycled into crushed concrete aggregates that were used in subgrade drainage layers under our roads. And you may be interested to know that Council even used crumbler rubber from recycled tyres in seals applied under the layers of asphalt. Mm -hmm. Trials are well advanced to progress the use of crumbed rubber as a bitumen additive. 
Not only does it have the potential to improve the strength and durability of our roads, but it will be a great initiative to recycle tyres and put them to good use. This is really exciting work Council is doing because tyres are very challenging when it comes to recycling. Recently, you may have heard about the use of plastic additives in roads. This is just another example of how Brisbane City Council leads the nation when it comes to innovation and cutting-edge research. Using recycled plastic in roads is something our researchers have been working on and, and investigating for some time. In fact, we have already trialled the use of using plastic in roads. In 2017-18 financial year, we resurfaced Allen Street in Kedron with a trial plastic additive that is claimed to improve the strength and durability of the asphalt whilst reducing the quantity of bitumen required in the mix. Our researchers and laboratory staff are monitoring the progress of this trial and continue to investigate and be on the lookout for bigger, better and greener ways to deliver the infrastructure our growing city needs. Not only do we do this in a sustainable way, Mr Chair, but also with efficiency, delivering value for money for the ratepayers of Brisbane. These sustainable practices save Brisbane residents more than $4 million a year, with glass recycling increasing by 40 per cent over the past year. Up to 20 per cent of the annual volume of asphalt produced is recycled materials, which in turn decreases the requirement of, for fresh bitumen and materials from quarries. Council's asphalt plant not only delivers value for money for ratepayers, but is an industry leader in asphalt recycling, producing 450,000 tonnes of asphalt each year. The Eagle Farm plant was originally commissioned in 1991 and in its current configuration, although Brisbane City Council has been producing asphalt on this site at Eagle Farm since the Second World War. So, uh, Chair, this administration can be trusted to deliver the infrastructure our growing city needs. We have a long-term track record, record of delivering for the ratepayers of Brisbane. Road resurfacing projects are underway right across every ward across the city, delivering an Councillor unprecedented Howard, number. Councillor Howard, that concludes your allocation of time and also concludes question time. Councillors, I will now draw to your attention the consideration of committee reports and, the, in the first instance, the Establishment Coordination Committee. Lord Mayor. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the report of the, stab the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 21st of October 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, the 21st of October 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate, Lord Mayor? Uh, yes. Uh, before we go in uh, into the debate, I move that Clause C of the report uh, be taken as seriatim for debate and voting purposes. Item C will be taken seriatim for both debate and voting. Please continue. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. <clears throat> as, uh, as I normally do, I'd like to uh, provide a quick update on the uh, lighting up of council assets across the city uh, for important community causes. Uh, so today, the Tropical Dome at Mount Kutha, the Story Bridge and also the Victoria Bridge will be lit up teal for Sexual Violence Awareness Month. Sexual Violence Awareness Month is held uh, every October and the month aims to raise awareness of the widespread issue uh, this is in our community and work alongside the community in bringing change. Tomorrow, the Victoria Bridge, Story Bridge, Redcliffe Place and City Hall will be lit up green and gold to support the T20 cr cricket, uh, the Australia versus Sri Lanka match. Uh, and um, that will take place at the Gabba uh, in the second of a three series match. So obviously go Australia. Uh, Thursday, uh, we'll celebrate uh, local champions, the Brisbane Broncos women's team uh, for their outstanding uh, 2019 uh, NRLW Premiership. And we'll have the Victoria Bridge, Story Bridge, uh, lit up in maroon and gold to celebrate their fantastic win a few weeks ago. On Friday, uh, we're supporting MS Queensland's Moonlight Walk and the Story Bridge, Victoria Bridge, City Hall and Radcliffe Place will be lit up red in support uh, of this event. Uh, it's been another busy week um, out and about right across the city. Uh, but I did want to mention a few um, uh, memorable visits, uh, in particular, uh, uh, the busy weekend that we've had. Uh, it was great to be with Councillor Marks at the Sunnybank Hills State School Multifest, 
Uh, I've been to a lot of school fates in my time, but this was a school fate with a difference, with very multicultural flavour. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Councillor Marks has been very active in supporting that event um, with the Lord Mayor's Community Fund and before that the Lord Mayor's Suburban Initiative Fund. It was a great event for the local community and going well beyond um, that school as well and branching out into the local community. Uh, it was great on Friday night to be at the uh, Diwali celebration here in King George Square um, where we had a massive turnout um, to celebrate the Indian Festival of Lights. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the councillors who supported and attended that event. And then uh, there was very much a Halloween flavour to this weekend. Um, and much to my kids' delight, we got to go to several Halloween events across the city. I must admit, it took me a while to, uh, to get into the Halloween trend. Um, you know, my, my parents were always, oh, that's, that's crass Americanism. Um, and so we never really had much of a Halloween celebration in our household. Uh, but I have to say my view on Halloween has changed. It is a great way of bringing the community together. Um, and it's a, it's a bit of a fun celebration, a bit of a quirky celebration. Uh, and it has been great to be involved. Uh, being out in, um, in Manly for the big Manly Harbour Village um, uh, Halloween festival, that was one of the, I think it was the first big one in Brisbane. It's been going for 25 years and they're getting something like 20,000 people turn up to that event, which is uh, incredible. Uh, so it was good to be out there with Councillor Cumming uh, on Friday, uh, sorry, on Saturday night. But then on Sunday as well, being uh, at the Blackwood Street uh, Mitchelton Halloween Festival with yourself, uh, with Councillor Davis uh, and also Councillor Toomey. Uh, did I miss anyone? Um, Julian Simmons. Uh, and also Tim Manda were there, and, and also thousands of people get coming together, bringing the community together. And that was followed, off, uh, followed up um, on Sunday night by a visit to the Calumvale Ward, uh, where um, Councillor Angela Owen had uh, Halloween movies in the park out there, and it was great to go out and celebrate with uh, Councillor Angela Owen and the local community. And once again, a very multicultural flavour as well out there and great support from local um, community organisations across these different Halloween events. Um, so you're seeing Lions and Rotary, Girl Guides, all involved in helping to make these events possible, Chambers of Commerce. Um, so it's been, it, you know, it has been a big Halloween weekend, but one, as I said, that is great and we should celebrate because it brings the community together and that is always a very good thing. Uh, in terms of the uh, items that are before us, item A is the TLPI for Civic Spaces and Iconic Vistas. Uh, and the purpose of this TLPI is to ensure that, the, that we have the continued protect, protection of the CBD's key civic spaces and iconic vistas. As the Chamber will be aware, uh, Major Amendment Package F was recently progressed to the State Government for the final State Interest Check. The protection afforded by the TLPI is contained within package F and will shortly be reflected in the city's planning scheme, subject to state government endorsement. Uh, by now, the chamber will be aware of the length of time it can take to progress an amendment to city plan in accordance with the state government's uh, minister's guidelines and rules. The last thing we want is for the 21st of November uh, to come around when the TLPI expires. Um, and the state government still haven't completed their checks to progress the amendment for adoption of that gazettal. So uh, this TLPI is obviously a precaution, uh, but nonetheless an important one to ensure that those uh, parts of our civic spaces and vistas are protected. I am pleased though that the minister has endorsed the TLPI and uh, the item is on the agenda for it to proceed to adoption and gazettal. Uh, item B, uh, is a minor amendment to city plan, uh, which is uh, package L. Uh, is that L or I? I? I, sorry, I've got a capital here, so it looks like an L, uh, package I. Uh, the uh, package I is another example of this administration continuing to keep our city's planning scheme up to date in line with community expectations. Uh, the amendment will do the following things. First of all, it will maintain the currency of the planning scheme by ensuring that infrastructure standards and zoning changes reflect current development approvals, uh, together with updating overlay maps to reflect these changes. 
Uh, minor Amendment I also has an administrative component that will improve the usability of the planning scheme by enhancing its format and presentation, including mapping and text refinements. Uh, should the Chamber resolve to approve the proposed amendment, Minor I will take effect from 29th of November uh, uh, this year. That's uh, all I had for items A and B, Mr Chair. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just ask that item uh, well, A and B be taken seriatim uh, for voting. For voting alone? Yes. Yeah, item yeah. A for voting. Yep. Yeah, so, so each proceed. of them voted on separately. Thank you. Uh, so on uh, clause A, we'll of course be supporting the TLPI over the civic spaces uh, and iconic vistas. Uh, and as the Lord Mayor has said, this is um, again, yeah, that's right. Uh, Lord Mayor has said this is progressing through the amendment and uh, we certainly, uh, as we have in the past, uh, show our appreciation to the state government for their very quick turnaround uh, in the initial TLPI that was submitted uh, just days before a state election uh, last time, uh, back in uh, late 2017. So that turnaround uh, was quite remarkable uh, and we certain that had bipartisan support, of course, at a, at a state level, uh, given the nature of the caretaker period that we were in at the time. But this should never have got to that point, and that is the point uh, of this issue. Uh, not only do we have City Plan 2014, which should have picked up, uh, that this, this was an issue, that we had no protection over that public space at Redcliffe Place. The City Centre Neighbourhood Plan progressed through all of those stages and at no point did this administration pick up an issue that there was no protection over the public space at Redcliffe Place. Uh, and of course, the City Centre Master Plan that whole process went through a few, just a few years ago, uh, and this administration uh, couldn't see a gap so large that you could drive a D9 dozer through it, Chair. Uh, so while we are supportive of protecting the iconic vistas in this public space for the people of Brisbane, uh, that stuff up is on you, LMP. We should never have got to this point, uh, but we're of course uh, willing uh, to help you mop up your mess when it comes to this. On item B, the minor uh, and administrative amendments to Brisbane City Plan, I'll be very interested to hear uh, the comments, uh, given the Lord Mayor didn't go through in great detail about a lot of these amendments. I realise some of them are typographical uh, and reflect some changes that have gone through as a result um, of development applications being approved and whatnot, uh, but there are a large number of properties that are being removed, uh, 42 in total being removed from the... Uh, heritage overlay, area joining heritage subcategory, uh, right across the city there. It gives us the addresses, the lot descriptions, uh, and the reasons uh, almost universally for all of these uh, for the change is that it reflects a current development approval. So it would be handy to know, uh, we know this administration's track record uh, in allowing in allowing developers to get away with demolishing large parts of our city's heritage and character. Um, we would like a better explanation as to what the reason is for those being removed. There's six properties uh, being amended, uh, amending the extent or of the following properties on the heritage overlay themselves. Uh, and further back, 22 properties that will be uh, removed from the heritage overlay local heritage subcategory. Again, no great explanation um, there, nor the ones that are being added as well. And I presume some of those are ones that have been picked up through perhaps neighbourhood planning processes or nominated and gone through the Heritage Advisory Committee, perhaps. Uh, but these things are never explained properly, um, not explained properly to us, councillors, who are being required to vote on these items on behalf of our residents. Uh, and they're certainly not explained properly to the residents of Brisbane about some of these changes. Uh, that has certainly uh, been evidenced just recently in my community chair uh, with the release of the draft strategy for the Sangain District Neighbourhood Plan, uh, where that, uh, some of those major changes uh, to that community have come as a great, great surprise to people. Uh, so we think we owe it to them to get some more information and we'll reserve uh, our judgment uh, based on what the chair of the City Planning Committee says as to whether we will uh, support this item or not. Further speakers? Anyone at all? Councillor Johnston. 
Uh, yeah, just briefly, um, particularly on item B, yes, I, I don't trust this administration. Um, they've clearly demonstrated a track record over many, oh, sorry, and item C, they've clearly um, demonstrated a track record over many years of failing to get the planning needs of our city right. And um, week after week, they bring these half-baked um, changes into uh, council um, without a lot of detail, without uh, explanation. Um, the problem is the document you're working with, City Plan 2014, is an inherently flawed and botched document. Um, and for those of us that were here in 2014 and sat through a week-long debate, almost to a T, the issues we raised at that time are the ones that are causing all of the problems. Um, plus all of the other things you know, that you assured us were all fixed and fine, which clearly are not. So I don't trust, um, I don't trust the administration when it comes to planning for our city any longer. Uh, with respect to item C, this is Councillor Johnston, I must stop you there. Item C has been taken stereo. Oh, for debate. I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. Just, that's it on but it's item just been B. taken yes. for both debate and voting, so it's oh, separate. It's still to come. That, yep, that's it then. Thank you. Right. Further, further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Listen, um, I just want to talk on item B, the minor amendments. Um, and um, I um, when I looked at the um, the fact that I mean they are yes they are minor amendments and a few uh, changes are made from time to time in these areas. I decided to sort of have a look at um, I don't know have a look at those coloured maps you know of the um, the overlays that uh, accompany them um, and uh, and just a couple of things uh, when you start looking through those um, those those overlays some sometimes things pop up that you didn't know was a thing and other times you thought you thought it was a thing and it you know and but it's not showing up so um, in regards to some of those things that I wasn't aware of uh, and maybe should have been aware of but anyways um, the Samoan church um, is listed as a now this is the old uh, Ritz uh, cinema at uh, Coconut Grove uh, in Anala uh, that was uh, opened in 1956 and uh, has had a few iterations uh, since the cinema closed up because of it, it, it says TV sort of took over uh, back in the uh, mid, mid to late 50s and of course cinemas were suburban citizens suburban cinemas were struggling a bit so it became a few other things as well but currently now it is the Samoan church but it's listed as a local heritage place and um, I uh, ha had to uh, ask my uh, uh, ward advisor um, um, who grew up in the area I said uh, why would you think that they would he says well she said that internally um, the architecture internally is quite special uh, and that's why it's probably been preserved and uh, and consequently I've had a look and it's absolutely true um, the um, the other the other thing that um, that jumped out at me as well was that the Serbian church uh, which earlier either late last year or early this year received a um, I think it's well it should certainly be included in the overlays as a significant uh, heritage uh, place uh, I think was given some status by the heritage um, advisory committee uh, but it, it doesn't seem to be um, uh, it doesn't seem to have received that in the in the overlay so I, I'd ask the uh, the chair of planning to maybe have a look into that uh, maybe, maybe it hasn't gone through the full cycle of process, uh, and uh, and it hasn't shown it up yet. But being that um, uh, Council Brook will be looking after this area of Wakel uh, uh, after uh, 28th of March next year, uh, that maybe he maybe maybe it could be worth having a look at. Um, but uh, the other things, what I, the other thing I didn't really uh, understand until um, started looking into it as well is that even a stand of trees can be considered a, uh, a significant uh, a significant heritage place as well and I, I didn't know that I had two of these uh, um, one one is in Heritage Park at uh, in Forest Lake where the original um, Farley family had a homestead uh, um, for their Archfield uh, property uh, and then there was one at 839 uh, Blunder Road um, and uh, I said to my ward advisor I said Pam do you know what would be a heritage? Why would that be heritage? And we had a look, and there it is uh, on the um, on the uh, database. Uh, it's a stand of uh, a row of stand of uh, mango trees that were planted in 1920. So it was just uh, an interesting exercise to and to be you know I just became a little bit more informed about what things 
can be listed as heritage listed or uh, or of significance. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers, Councillor Burke. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just rise to enter the debate on item A. Uh, and item B uh, before us today. Uh, and it's always interesting to hear the Australian Labor Party talk about uh, planning issues because uh, we know, uh, Mr Chairman, that uh, their time in this place, they certainly had one view when it comes uh, to planning. It was to jam people into parts of the city, Mr Chairman, to apply this socialist template uh, to town planning, to have complete disregard for residents' views uh, and to just do whatever they wanted to do to communities across the city. Unlike this side of the chamber, Mr Chairman, that goes through uh, an award-winning process of neighbourhood planning that's not just award-winning, Mr Chairman, but so good that the state government have adopted it as the process that they encourage other councils to adopt when they're looking to doing community planning across the state, Mr Chairman. Uh, so we understand that every time the Labor Party stands up in this place and speaks about town planning or neighbourhood planning, Mr Chairman, it comes with that deep ingrained dislike of neighbourhood planning that we know they had, that they had way back in 2004 where they deliberately tried to sabotage and destroy the process, Mr Chairman. Not my words, their words in emails and correspondence that was left behind when Councillor Hinchcliffe vacated the Deputy Mayor's office upstairs in this building. Uh, and we know that they never have liked or, or wanted to like or wanted to encourage their communities to fully participate in neighbourhood planning uh, and have the full benefit of that process so that their communities can get not only good planning outcomes, but indeed the infrastru infrastructure to support planning or the infrastructure to support the growth that our city is seeing, Mr Chairman. Uh, and no greater case was on display today uh, because Councillor Cassidy, in his, bluff and in his bluff and bravado that he has in this place, Mr Chairman, stood up and he declared that there's a, there was a gap so large you could drive a D9 bulldozer through the city centre master plan and city plan 2000 because of Radcliffe Place. And that they were mopping up our mess. They were going to help mop up our mess, Mr Chairman. Well, I'll tell you what, Mr Chairman, through you to Councillor Cassidy, the only people mopping up a mess here is us from Jim Sawley, David Hinchcliffe and the Australian Labor Party that monumentally stuffed up the approval for Brisbane Square and Radcliffe Place that did not condition to protect this space from the opportunity of development into the future. You guys on that side of the chamber, you should hang your heads in shame. You were in power. You let the people of Brisbane down. You let them down Councilor because Burke, you did not Councilor condition. Burke, can, I encourage, can I direct you to uh, address councillors in a third party and all comments through the chair, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I was saying, the Australian Labor Party councillors should hang their heads in shame. They let the people of Brisbane down. They didn't condition the DA for Brisbane Square and Radcliffe Place properly when they had the chance. They left the door open. They opened the gap for the D9 bulldozer, Mr Chairman, uh, which might be taking a break from uh, doing other work, could be actually building things in the city. Instead, the D9 bulldozer is going through the Australian Labor Party's gap in their planning scheme back in 2000 and the DA that they approved. The DA that they approved for this site, Mr Chairman. So the only people, the only people who are mopping up a mess is this side of the chamber. We're mopping up your mess, Councillor Cassidy. Your embarrassing mess when your colleagues, Councillor Cummings, shouldn't be interjecting, because he was probably here when they approved the DA, Mr Chairman, Councillor Cummings shouldn't be interjecting. Um, your mess and lack of foresight and lack of detail when it comes to approving the development application uh, for Brisbane Square. And I'm glad that the state government has approved uh, this TLPI, and I thank Minister Dick for doing it uh, speedily and helping us make sure that we have this ongoing protection. Uh, the relevant major amendment package will be coming back to the chamber in not too much time. Um, I believe we're very close to getting tick off from the state uh, so that we can pr progress that. And then this will be fixed once and for all. We'll have cleaned up the mess of the Australian Labor Party uh, and have dealt with that issue. Uh, just turning to item B, Mr Chairman, and this is another one of those examples. It seems like every week I have to say the same things, Mr Chairman. Uh, this is another one of those examples where uh, the Australian Labor Party likes to read the sections of the report that suit their narrative and their argument but not necessarily read the whole report, which I would hope councillors do. Because um, if Councillor Cassidy had taken the time uh, and gone from page 34 of the report before us, particularly table 23, he would find that a large number of the heritage places uh, that are being removed or having part of their area removed in the local heritage subcategory uh, are because of changes to reflect the Kirtledge of State Heritage Place. 
So I haven't done the quick count, but I could do it, Mr Chairman, if you want me to. It would seem, though, that uh, the significant ones here, so uh, Glen Egg Street, South Brisbane, uh, the other two properties at Glen Egg Street, South Brisbane, the third property at Glen Egg Street, South Brisbane, 140 Gray Street, 114 Gray Street, 149 Gray Street, uh, 1,003 lots, 1 to 1,038 at 161 Gray Street. Um, the next lot of streets at Gray Street, the next lot of addresses at Gray Street are all, if you read the whole sentence that's contained in that far right hand column under reasons, uh, ref say these words, constitute a minor amendment to the planning scheme pursuant to Schedule 1, Section 2 of the MGR, as it is not of a minor nature that does not include zoning changes, open bracket, to reflect the curtilage of a state heritage place. So just a little, just read a little bit further past your own political agenda uh, and your opportunity to try and score cheap political points, Mr. Chairman. And you might get the information that you need to help you make an informed decision, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there's a number of changes, though, uh, in uh, this uh, document that we have before us. A lot of them are typographical, reflecting some of the changes to the relevant PDAs, Mr. Chairman, that uh, sit uh, in Brisbane and the processes that have been undertaken by the state government uh, and how they now are uh, progressing and we have interim plans for those particular sites. There's also additions to the heritage uh, overlays, both um, the council heritage overlay, but also the addition of the Jibung State School to the state as a state heritage place, uh, Mr Chairman, as well. There's changes to the Archfield Airport uh, overlays and the maps uh, that relate to that in regards to the airport environs overlay, uh, as well as, Mr Chairman, as I said, those typographical changes uh, which address some of the changes that the state government has made to planning schemes, but also reflect uh, some of the changes that have happened to uh, sites across the city as well. There's also, uh, as uh, Councillor Cassidy said, a number of other changes uh, that are in the document before us today to reflect development applications that have been approved or changes to the zoning um, uh, where it's going from emerging communities uh, to another zone, Mr Chairman. And I would encourage the Australian Labor Party, given their poor track record on things like protecting Radcliffe Place, that they just take a minute, find uh, some solace in the fact that both of these documents are here uh, and support both of them, because obviously, uh, given the comments from Councillor Cassidy about uh, the importance of protecting heritage and, and history in this city, he wouldn't want to be voting against changes that actually protect and increase the protections for heritage places and places of significance in our city, um, and wouldn't want to be voting against that, but would want to be supporting it and be on the right side uh, with the community when it comes to these important things that we're dealing with. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor. I'll now put the resolution firstly for item A. All those in favour of oh no, excuse me. No, I'll do item A now. All those in favour of item A, say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. Uh, the ayes have it. And now to item B. All those in favour of item B, say aye. Aye. And to the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 20 in favour, one against and six abstentions. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats. Okay. Uh, Lord Mayor, Clause C 
uh, of the report of the ENC, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, I, uh, I want to declare a conflict of interest in relation to Clause C. Um, I note that um, parties on both sides of the chamber have received political donations from QBE Insurance. Uh, and obviously, I'm a member of the LNP, uh, and uh, the recipient of the claim of settlement, which is QBE Insurance, made a donation to the LNP uh, Queensland as follows. $5,000 in June 2016 and 2200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr Point Chair. Of order to you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'd like to declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement QB insurance made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows. $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr. Point of order, Chair. Councillor Richards. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement for QBE insurance made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows: five thousand dollars in June 2016 and two thousand two hundred dollars in August 2016. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Councillor Marks. Yes, I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am also a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows: five thousand in June 2016 and two thousand two hundred in August 2016. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Councillor Mackay. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows. $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Davis. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows, $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. A point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Murphy. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland, the recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance. Made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows, $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Atwood. I declare a con conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland, the recipient of a claim of settlement, QBE Insurance. Made a donation to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows, $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Councillor Huang. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland, the recipient of the claim of settlement QBE insurance. Made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Councillor Owen. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows, $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Landers. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland, the recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows, $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Cunningham. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows, $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Maddock. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland, the recipient of the claim of settlement. QB Insurance made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows, $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Hammond. 
I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The, re um, the recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows. $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Burke. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Councillor Howard. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Councillor Allen. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows. $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr Point Chair. Point of order, Councillor McLaughlin. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows, $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Toomey. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I'm a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland, a recipient of the claim of settlement QBE Insurance that made donations to the Liberal National Party as follows, $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. I also declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I am a member of the Liberal National Party of Queensland. The recipient of the claim of settlement QBE Insurance made donations to the Liberal National Party of Queensland as follows, $5,000 in June 2016 and $2,200 in August 2016. Are there any other conflicts of interest that need to be declared in relation to this matter? Can, uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, sorry, I, can you um, say point of order? Point of order, Chair. Point of order, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you. I um, wish to advise, I believe, I also have a, uh, wish to, uh, a conflict of interest and would like to declare that uh, in Clause C. I'm a member of the Australian Labor Party Queensland branch, uh, the recipient of the a claim of settlement, QBE Insurance, made a donation to the Australian Labor Party Queensland branch on the 8th of the 3rd, 2016, uh, and the amount was $1,500. Point of order, Mr Chair. I Point of order, Councillor Cook. Thank you. I also declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I'm a member of the Australian Labor Party of Queensland, the recipient of the claim of settlement, QB Insurance made a donation to the Australian Labor Party Queensland branch on the 8th of March 2016 in the amount of $1,500. That's very tediously repetitious. Um, yes, uh, so I have a point of order. It, it's important. It is, I know it's repetitious, but it is important. Oh, yeah, I know. It's the law. Point of order, I understand that. Griffith. I'm just saying it's tediously repetitious, but I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I'm a member of the Australian Labor Party of Queensland. We're a recipient of the uh, claim of settlement of QBE insur insurance, um, and they made a donation to the Australian Labor Party of Queensland on the 8th of the 3rd, 2016, for an amount of $1,500. Thanks, Mr Chair. Mr. Chair. I declare a conflict of interest in Clause C. I'm a member of the Australian Labor Party of Queensland, who is the recipient of a uh, donation from QBE Insurance of $1,500 on the 8th of March 2016. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I declare a conflict of interest uh, on item C. I'm a member uh, of the Australian Labor Party um, who uh, was a recipient. Oh, who was recipient of a claim from QBE Insurance um, or because of the QBE Insurance claim um, and uh, who made a donation to the Australian Labor Party uh, on the 8th of the 3rd, 2016 of $1,500. 
Lord Mayor, as a majority of the councillors present have declared a conflict of interest in the matter, may I please have a motion about the delegation of this matter to a relevant delegate in Point. accordance with section 238 of the City of Brisbane Act 2010. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Uh, firstly, Mr Chairman, I want to place on the record that I did not take any donations from uh, uh, QBA. Yeah, what is the point of order? Uh, yeah, what is the point of order? What is, is the point of order? And I'm extremely disappointed that we don't get to speak on this matter because okay. I have you. serious problems with referring this back thank, to the thank CEO's you, Councillor office Johnston. No, 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 that's with a debate. the deal that's, that's been done here. Lord Mayor, can you please— That it's not Mayor, getting please, any public scrutiny. Can you please put that resolution? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that this chamber resolve that, as a majority of councillors present have declared a conflict of interest in this matter, deciding this matter be delegated to the Chief Executive Officer in accordance with Section 238 of the City of Brisbane Act 2010. Seconded. It has been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that as a majority of councillors present have declared a conflict of interest in this matter, that council resolve that deciding this matter be delegated to the Chief Executive Officer in accordance with Section 238 of the City of Brisbane Act 2010. Is there any debate? Lord Mayor. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Just briefly, uh, whatever any councillor may think about this uh, and about whether it's uh, um, a tedious thing or whether it's um, outrageous that you don't get to debate it, the law is the law. And uh, this administration is absolutely uh, ensuring that uh, we follow the letter of the law and do things appropriately. Now, if you don't like the law, go and talk to the state government That's right. because they have imposed uh, these requirements on us. Uh, and They have imposed these requirements on us, uh, and that means that uh, whether we like it or not, we cannot debate in this chamber about an issue where the majority of co uh, councillors are conflicted. Uh, and I think um, uh, uh, that we need to remind ourselves that Section 177E, in bracket 6, of the City of Brisbane Act states, if a majority of the councillors at a meeting of the council inform the meeting about personal interests in the matter, under subsection 2, the Council must delegate deciding the matter under section 238, unless deciding the matter cannot be delegated under this section. Now, section 238, in brackets 1 of the City of Brisbane Act, states Council may, by resolution, delegate a power under this Act or another Act to a. the Mayor, b. the Chief Executive Officer. C, a standing committee or a joint standing committee. D, another local government. Uh, we won't be doing that. Uh, and E, the establishment and coordination committee meeting. Um, so, so obviously out of all of those options, unless we want to delegate it to Logan City Council or Redlands or Moreton Bay, um, then we have to delegate it to the CEO because all of those other options have potential conflicts. So uh, we, by letter of the law, um, are doing what the law requires us to do here, which is to delegate this matter to the CEO uh, for a decision. So obviously none of those other options are available or uh, realistic or practical. Uh, and so uh, it is only fair and reasonable that this matter be delegated to the CEO based um, on the current legislation and state requirements that we have in place. Now, this situation uh, raises some questions about, well, well are these uh, matters really causing a conflict here? Uh, this is something that the state government has talked about clarifying, because if you go too much further down this track, um, then you find important decisions that councillors can't debate on, can't be involved in. And that's not our choice. That's what the state government is telling us based on the current legislation. Now, local governments all across Queensland have asked for these matters to be clarified and to be made so that they're set up in a way that is practical, so that the process of democracy in a place like Brisbane City Council can continue on, so that councillors can have input in appropriate matters. Uh, and the state has indicated that they do want to change and clarify the conflict of interest provisions. Unfortunately, um, that hasn't occurred yet. That has not occurred. 
We saw um, another round of so-called Belcara provisions introduced, which have nothing to do with Belcara, mind you, uh, but they didn't take the opportunity to clarify these matters uh, and they've squibbed it. So what they want to do is obviously put it off until after the council election. Uh, so um, it would have been nice to have um, clarification of these matters. And so we are taking a very cautious approach and one that we believe is very compliant in compliance with the law so that we're doing the right thing here. But what that ultimately means is under state government laws, we can't debate this matter. It's as simple as that. Do I like that? Probably not. Is it the law? Right now it is. Um, so we have no choice but to delegate this to the CEO. Further speakers? Now, Councillor Johnston, I, uh, I will recognise you as a speaker, but I must insist on the most narrow interpretation about debate on this matter and that anything that appears yep. to be debate about the substance, it would be, in my opinion, a breach of the law that we are trying to adhere to. So please keep your um, um, comments solely to the resolution at hand. Yes, and uh, uh, I am entitled to uh, speak to this motion before us today, and I don't have a problem with everybody individually standing up and declaring uh, potential conflict of interest. I believe that's the right thing uh, to do, and I agree completely with that. Um, however, my concern is the motion before us, which is the referral back to the CEO uh, for consideration with respect uh, to this matter. Um, whilst I won't go into any of the details, um, as you've said, with respect to item C, there are serious um, unanswered questions in the matter before us today, and they will receive no public scrutiny um, if the person who recommended the outcome is the person who makes the decision about the outcome, and that is wrong. That is completely wrong. So I do not believe we should be referring this matter back to the same people who've made the recommendation up when there are such serious unanswered questions in here um, about the financial insurance transaction that is before us in the matter today. Um, that is my problem with this issue. Um, and uh, I appreciate the legislation says that because the LNP councillors took money uh, through donations to their political party and the ALP councillors took money through donations to their political party. There's two councillors that didn't. Um, we could make a decision on this if the law was changed. Um, yeah, well, if the law was changed. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Johnson take a question? Oh, yes, at great personal risk, I'm sure. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> through you, Mr Chair. I'm, I'm just... Proceed. I'm just genuinely interested in who do you th which body or who do you think is the best place to make this decision? What I, uh, at this point, I would say to you that any councillors who don't have a conflict of interest could uh, make the decision um, as a committee. So why don't we set up a standing committee um, in some way that could have councillors without conflicts um, being considered? I'm sure there's a way to do it. but. But, hey, I'm speaking and I was asked Whoa. the question Whoa. and, and... OK, OK, everybody. And... All right. Everybody stop. Everybody, Councillor Murphy, everybody, please. Um, I appreciate the respectful manner that we have conducted ourselves to this point. I'd like it to continue. Councillor Johnston. And the Johnston. peanut gallery was asking me what's the answer, and I'm giving you another one. We do not but refer... That was Councillor Shree who asked you what the answer was. No. And please... The Lord Mayor was no, also please heavily... Point of order, Mr Chair. Councillor Johnston. Councillor Owen. Um, as Councillor Shri asked the question, I don't feel it's appropriate that Councillor Johnston should have referred to him as the peanut gallery. I, I, Councillors I, are meant to... Now, look, OK. Thank you, Councillor Owen. I have already um, protected Councillor Shri. Um, I, I, I would like this, this matter to be uh, continue in the respectful spirit that it has begun, and I would like Councillor Johnston to continue, please. So just to be clear for the record, it was the Lord Mayor who was calling out uh, during my answer, uh, not Councillor Shree, who asked the question. Um, so, but my biggest problem here is we are referring this individual matter back to the same person who's made the recommendation. And that is fundamentally the problem um, when there is a complex and controversial issue to be considered. So there must be a better way to do it um, than uh, what is being proposed today. Um, and I have very serious concerns about the substance of this matter. 
um, which I'm told I cannot debate, which is redacted in the information in the report before us today. And it is absolutely wrong that there will be no public transparent scrutiny about this matter because the same people who are recommending the solution are the people who will make the decision without public scrutiny. And that is where this system is wrong. Um, that is where uh, there needs to be um, an alternative mechanism, um, because uh, certainly, um, uh, it, certainly there is a better way to do this, particularly using councillors who don't have a conflict of interest in a matter. Further speakers, Councillor Shree. Uh, Councillor Shree, also, um, please uh, can I remind you of the, the notes I uh, provide to Councillor Johnston at the beginning of her presentation, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak on the motion to refer this um, matter back to the CEO. And I think today is perhaps one of the clearest illustrations we've ever seen in this place of the problem of corporate donations. And I, I think it, it was telling to see how many councillors in this place had to stand up and declare a conflict of interest because their parties had accepted corporate donations. Because their parties had accepted corporate donations. And I think it is deeply concerning that our democracy is being undermined by the fact. Now, councillors, please, no interjections allow all councillors to be heard in silence. It is deeply concerning that Councilor our democracy Shree. is being undermined by the fact that councillors have to recuse themselves from important decisions because they have that conflict of interest. I, I think it is the right decision to, um, in this case, to refer the matter back to the CEO. But the fact that we have to do that shows that there is a serious problem in this city where big decisions that perhaps should be made by elected representatives are not being made by those elected and democratically accountable representatives because so many of them are compromised. It makes visible one of the great flaws in our democracy. We know that donations from big companies to political parties have the potential to corrupt our decision making. We know that donations are problematic. And yet, the parties keep taking them. And so it's right that councillors are declaring a conflict of interest, and it's right that they shouldn't be making a decision on this matter. But it, it, it shows very clearly that it's going to continue to cause problems with, if every time we have to make a decision about a company that's donated to the Labor Party or the Liberal Party, all the councillors in the room have, have to remove themselves from the chamber. How, how often is this going to become an issue? How, how many different corporations have donated to the two major parties in, in recent years? I don't actually know the number. I know that they take a lot of money in corporate donations. And I know that that does... Sorry, Mr Chair, if other councillors have a question for me, I'm happy to take questions, but I can't hear the interjections. No, I understand that. And once again, I'll remind councillors to, uh, that this debate uh, should proceed in silence and allow the speakers to be heard. Councillor Shree. Thank you, Mr Chair. Does um, feel as though I might have hit a sore point for some councillors in this chamber because they understand intuitively that there is something wrong with taking donations from big business. There is something fundamentally wrong about the fact that corporations can make campaign donations to political parties. That's why we have these laws that require conflicts of interest to be declared. But when 24 out of the 26 councillors have to stand up and declare a conflict of interest, I think it, it shows that there's a real problem here. And I think it's, a, it's an important one for hopefully triggering some deeper reflection within the parties about whether they should continue to take these business donations. Um, I, I know in, the Greens have had, had this difficult conversation here in Queensland. We've made a decision to stop taking corporate donations because we think it's problematic for democracy. I understand the Greens used to take business donations, um, and I don't think that was the right thing to do. But we've had to have that difficult conversation in our party and, and decide, no, here in Queensland, we're going to stop taking those business donations. And maybe it's time that the, the other two major parties did the same, because I don't think this is healthy for democracy. I think when members of the public look at the, or watch, watch the video stream of this meeting, it's going to look a little bit farcical. And it's, it's, not, it's not going to reflect well on the major parties, because it shows and makes visible the corrupting influence that corporate donations can have on our political system. And if you feel uncomfortable that, about that, if you're feeling a little bit defensive, um, maybe you should talk to your residents and talk to the voters in your electorate about whether they think it's appropriate for political parties to take donations from corporations. 
because I'd hazard a guess that the majority of voters do not feel comfortable with the fact that city councillors' election campaigns are being funded by big business. That is not democratic. It is not healthy. It, it certainly undermines confidence in the system. I'm glad that we now have laws requiring us to at least declare these conflicts of interest, but we obviously need to go a lot further and ban corporations from donations to donate into political parties altogether. Otherwise, this is going to keep happening, and this decision-making body is going to be paralysed from being able to make decisions on important issues any time one of those major corporate donors is involved. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor. <clears throat> Uh, thank you to those councillors who participated. Uh, in relation to some of the comments that have been made about political donations, we operate in the framework that's created by the state government. And um, I'm getting dizzy by the amount of times the state government is changing the rules when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, it seems like before elections, they change the rules in their favours and favour, and then after the election, they change them back again. Um, it's just it's all over the place. But the reality is. Um, the current situation uh, with council elections, and it has been the case for a long time, is that there is no public funding for council elections. There is no public funding for council elections. Unlike the state and federal governments, unlike the state and councillors, councillor Johnston, please. Unlike the state and federal governments. So, to be clear, at the state and federal government level, there is taxpayer money that is used to fund election campaigns. That does not exist at the council level. Uh, so um, there is a very difference, uh, big difference in the two systems. Um, I'm not going to go into... Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Shree. Will the Mayor take a question? Lord Mayor, would you take a question? No. Lord Mayor, please continue. We could, we could be here all night to debate um, the, the pros and cons of different systems, but the reality is, unlike the other two levels of government, we don't have public funding. And so campaigns don't happen without people supporting those campaigns with do donations. It's as simple as that. That is the system that we have got. That is the system that has been in place for council for a very long time. So it's certainly not something we introduced, uh, and it's been around a like for a very long time. Uh, but the reality is, if the state government wants to again change the system, they will do that. Uh, we will have our say at whatever time they propose to make those changes. Uh, but I am very cynical about any changes coming from the state government uh, when it comes to electoral uh, laws, voting systems and donations, because all the evidence that I've seen is that they only do it if it's in their political electoral favour. Um, and uh, we know that they ban various types of donations and restricted various types of donations, yet they are rolling in the cash from the union movement. They are rolling in truckloads of cash from the union movement. Um, so, anyway, like I said, we could talk uh, all night about these matters, but we are doing the right thing according to the law, according to those laws set by the state government. And until such time as those laws may change in one way or another, uh, we will continue uh, to follow what they require us to do, which is in this case, delegate to the CEO. Uh, thank you. Now, put that resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Thank you, councillors. I will now draw your... Oh, yes, Councillor Richards. Um, Mr Chair, I, as, as it's now 4.04, .04, I move that council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Uh, seconded. As a resolution moved by... Councillor Richards, seconded by Councillor Marks, that this council now adjourned for the purpose of afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it.
Buddy. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Mr Chair, I move the report of the Public and Active Transport Economic and Tourism Development Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Davis, to the report of the Public and Active Transport Economic and Tourism Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. This uh, last week's committee presentation was an update on the Love to Ride Brisbane program 2019. This is a fantastic global behaviour change program. It's our second year that we've been involved, and it ran throughout the month of September again this year. It's all about encouraging people to get on their bike and get out and get others to do the same as well. So it's fun, it's free, it's challenging. It's about getting your workmates, your friends and your family to experience all the benefits of riding the bike. This year, we had approximately 475 thousand people participated across 12 countries. It is workplace-based, it is using peer support, and what we are trying to do, particularly in Brisbane, is get an absolute long-term shift in riding behaviour for our commuters as well. As I said, free to participate to anyone who lives and works in Brisbane. The aim was to register and see who could get the most people riding bikes in a workplace. There were some great prizes for high-scoring workplaces, individual prizes for people who had the most participants to join, who rode the most times, who rode the furthest. There was also prizes like accessories, holidays and entertainment passes. It included some activities like finding uh, five try a bike sessions, so for people who don't have a bike and wanted to try out whether they might like to commute that way. And there was, um, this was really for the city-based employees in lunch times across the city as well. We also had electric bikes there for them to try as well for those who wanted an easier version of how to travel on their bike as well. So Radcliffe Place was host to smoothie bikes, where you rode your bike to make your smoothie and bike safety check classes as well. So I think it's fantastic. We saw an increase in the participation this year. By the end of the challenge, there were 2,840 participants in Brisbane from 253 organisations who collectively rode over 800,000 kilometres on 38,000 trips. So that is the equivalent of going around the world 15 times. Reduce the number of road car, uh, bikes on our road Tick, fantastic. <coughs> 90,000 kilograms of carbon not going into the atmosphere, fantastic. But from the participants, we heard the sum up. I enjoyed starting and finishing the day along the riverside. It's a great way to explore and enjoy Brisbane. I have City Cycle on my doorstep and I love playing tour guide to my family from Perth. This is a fantastic program. Look forward to rolling it out again next year. It's a great way for our people to explore our new bikeways and see whether riding is for them. We also had a petition last week that I will leave to the chambers for discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further debate? Anyone at all? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just briefly, I want to congratulate the administration for its support of um, this program. I think it's really positive to see that um, a bit of administrative attention is going towards um, these behaviour change programs. I do, of course, want to emphasise and reiterate that the main barrier still to cycling in Brisbane is safety, both perceived safety concerns and legitimate safety concerns. Um, and so sometimes I talk to residents and I say, oh, look, why don't you get involved with this ride to work program? Or why don't you get involved with the active, travel, active school travel programs? And consistently the response is that, oh yeah, of course we would love to ride, but it is literally too dangerous for us to do so. And so I, I want to really emphasise to the administration that it's all well and good to run these sorts of events or to support these sorts of programs and to be raising awareness and to try to help, help shift that cultural change or help shift cultural values. But at the same time, you actually need to be putting the money into the infrastructure and into the road network design changes so that it actually becomes safer to travel by active transport. And I note that there have been some small positive steps in this direction, but it's still nowhere near enough. We are still spending far too much money on road widening projects and intersection upgrades that don't encourage active transport and far too little on active transport and particularly on cycling infrastructure. So through you, Chair, to the Deputy Mayor, I just want to emphasise again, good job on this, but it's the infrastructure that we really need. If we want to get more people out there riding, we have to make it safer to do so. In some cases, that is going to mean taking away street parking for bike lanes. In some cases, that's going to mean rejigging intersections so that cars have to wait longer and pedestrians and cyclists don't have to wait as long. 
In some cases, that might even mean taking away lanes of general traffic in order to um, make room for, car for bikes, as we did on the Stanley Street stretch of the Woolloongabba Bikeway project. So we need to be willing to do that difficult work and sometimes that expensive work if we're actually going to see a significant shift in rider numbers in Brizzy. It's not, just, it's not going to be enough just to do a few social media posts and to put on a couple of morning breakfasts and leave it at that. Further speakers? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I thank Councillor Shri um, for the contribution to the debate. It is always a vexed question, but there is a lot of um, work that goes into our bikeways. This administration has delivered more bikeways than any administration um, in the history of Brisbane City Council, and 100 million are just this four-year term. There is complex areas, there is intersections that we would never upgrade to allow people to ride through them, and there's many intersections like the Land Street intersection that we definitely upgrade to make sure that it's suitable for cyclists as well. When it comes to making sure that infrastructure is everywhere, we do as much as we can, but we also need to make sure we have a very balanced approach when it comes to the amenity of residents, particularly in our inner city suburbs, with removal of car parking and who we're actually catering for when it comes to the cyclists. And when it comes, I suppose, to the residents that are concerned that it still doesn't feel safe enough, I hope that they're taking the opportunity to get immersed in the programs that I know Councillor Matic runs through Health and Active, which is all about bike safety, bike um, getting more confident, bike confidence around in groups and learning the bike ways and knowing where they are confident because with bike confidence comes that perception of feeling safe on those bike ways that we are delivering. But thank you for the contribution, Councillor Shree. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. <coughs> Excuse me. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. <coughs> Councillors, the Infrastructure Committee report, please. Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. Before talking about the uh, committee presentation, the items before us, I just wanted to bring to the attention of the Chamber and to congratulate uh, Council officers on recent awards that have been uh, awarded at the Institute of Public Works Engineering Australasia Queensland Division. Uh, the Chamber will be very pleased to know that the Engineer of the Year award went to Marie Gales, who we all know, I think, who's the manager for Council's Transport Planning and Operations. So well done, Marie. Congratulations. Uh, you've been recognised for your work in local government, your expertise as an engineer in the field and in, in particular for your leadership. So I commend the award and thank you for your hard work on behalf of the Council. Uh, Mr Chair, there was also a Road Safety Award. Council's Move Safe Brisbane Pedestrian Safety Review was honoured with the Road Safety Award by the Institute of Public Works, in Engineering Australasia, Queensland Division. Um, at the Chamber may be aware, I'm sure, that uh, Move Safe Brisbane has received more than 6,300 submissions or received more than 6,300 submissions from the community, identifying opportunities to improve pedestrian and cyclist safety across the city. Uh, Council has delivered so far seven outcomes of Moose Safe Brisbane, the Moose Safe um, Brisbane interim report, and has delivered or is currently working on delivering the final Moose Safe Brisbane report, which has nine outcomes and 31 recommendations. Um, Mr Chair, uh, I also wanted to draw to the attention of the Chamber the commendation that was awarded to the Telegraph Road Stage 2 project for projects worth over $10 million. Uh, Telegraph Road Stage 2, um, as residents of Deegan and Bracken Ridge Ward know, was the final stage in the Telegraph Road corridor and delivered approximately 2.1 kilometres of two-lane carriageway to four lanes with additional turning lanes at intersections, the removal of 12,000 tonnes of contaminated material uh, and the outcome of the construction of a new four-lane 72-metre bridge over Cabbage Tree Creek. So well done for all those hard-working council officers who received those awards. Uh, Mr Chair, I also want to draw to draw to the attention of the Chamber a student friendship ceremony that's at, uh, in the City Hall Auditorium tomorrow uh, between 3 and 5.30. Uh, Council will have a Move Safe info stall there with uh, police bilingual officers promoting awareness of pedestrians and road safety issues. Um, Mr Chair, before I just move on to the uh, committee report, I just wanted to uh, go back to a question that was asked of the Lord Mayor in the Council 
earlier um, in relation to the Oxley Road rail bridge uh, and to put on the record uh, Council's support for the state government getting on and doing what they said they would do uh, in relation to this particular uh, project or proposed project. So uh, the Lord Mayor wrote to the Minister Mark Bailey back in June 2018 on this issue precisely. Um, he pointing out that the state government's rail bridge on Oxley Road between Martindale and Gerald Streets is a significant constraint on traffic flows through the corridor. As you're aware, the letter says the bridge is owned by the Queensland government and is outside council's jurisdiction. This is why council has previously requested a formal funding commitment from the Queensland government in the form of a memorandum of understanding to undertake further investigations. Such work, the letter says to the minister, would identify the planning and design requirements to upgrade both of the rail and road network at this location. End of quote from that particular letter. And more recently, there was a, a letter from council, uh, and that letter was unresponded to, by the way, Mr Chair. Uh, also unresponded to was a letter uh, from Marie Gales, the Manager of Transport Planning and Operations. Uh, Councillor Johnston, <coughs> Councillor Johnston, do not interject like that. Point, Council, this, point of order, this, Mr Chairman. Hang on. Councillor Johnston, I hereby warn you that unless you, you cease interjecting, you may be suspended for a period of up to eight days. Furthermore, Councillor Johnston, if you are suspended, you must immediately leave the chamber meeting place and must remain away from all meeting places for the period of the suspension. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Yes, um, the state government has sent a letter. Councillor McLaughlin That's is misleading the you. chamber. Councillor McLaughlin. I'll take that interjection from Councillor Johnson. If she's aware of any response back from the state, uh, she should uh, bring that to the attention of the, uh, of the council. But uh, to date, there's been no response. And uh, this letter is so far unresponded to. Council, and this letter is to Mr Scott Riddell, the Executive General Manager of uh, Network Queensland Rail. Council, and the letter reads, Council has been advised that Queensland Rail has committed to upgrading this bridge and would be pleased to understand from you the timing of the planning and design works, as well as the construction timeframe of that, of, for that upgrade. As you are aware, the bridge's upgrade will impact on Council's surrounding local network, most notably Oxley Road between Martindale and Gerald Streets. The letter concludes, Council will be pleased to enter into a memorandum of understanding with QR to facilitate the planning for this project to ensure that necessary planning for the future curb alignment and footpath provisions along Oxley Road can be catered for, all back in QR court and the Queensland Government's court. Mr Chair, the committee report last week was about uh, our LED lighting program and rollout. Um, LED light emitting diodes, what is the acronym for uh, light emitting diodes, uh, has a life cycle Lighting has a life cycle three to four times longer than other lights, with energy savings of up to 60 per cent. Um, charging, changing to LED lighting reduces maintenance and replacement costs, as well as improving visibility. Referring to the Kelvin scale and the low range of 1,000 Kelvin up to 10,000. And I did find out for those who are at the committee who Kelvin was. Um, he was named, uh, he was a Glasgow engineer. Mr Chair, you'd be interested to know this. Uh, William Thompson, who was the first Baron Kelvin, who lived between 1824 and 1907 and gave us the gift of measuring light emitting light in Kelvins, so for the interest of the chamber. Um, council has uh, identified all lights on bikeways and within parks, as well as associated infrastructure and car parks where lighting is already located. Site inspections were undertaken to determine the viability of upgrades. And I'm pleased to say that uh, in the 1819 financial year, $3.3 million was invested, resulting in 1,316 light upgrades in 123 park sites and 333 lights in nine bikeways. The uh, 1920 uh, financial year, Mr Chair, has an allocated budget of $12.2 million and 1,146 lights in 115 parks and 42 lights in, in the bikeways have already been delivered. So the rest of the financial year is set to deliver approximately 2,000 lights at another 200 sites. Mr Chair, there are a couple of petitions there. I'll leave it at this stage to see if there's anybody who wants to participate in the debate. Further speakers? There being none, Councillor McLaughlin. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. 
To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Council, is the City Planning Report. Thanks, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Planning Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019, be adopted. And I second, Mr Chairman. It's been moved by Councillor Burke, seconded by Councillor Toomey, the report of the City Planning Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019, be adopted. Councillor Burke. Point of order, Mr Chair. Oh, excuse me. Point of order to you. Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I need to declare a material personal interest in relation to items B and C. Um, I personally own land in close proximity to the subject site, and uh, I may suffer a material loss or gain as a result of the outcome of the development application, and I intend to vacate myself from the chamber for the purposes of debate and voting for the uh, entire city, city planning. You, so, just to clarify, you'll be excusing yourself for the entirety yes. of the... Of thank the, you. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, Councillor Burke, please wait until Councillor Cook leaves. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, three items are on the uh, committee report from last week. Uh, there was a development application uh, for uh, 126 Cornwall Street, Woolloongabba, Mr Chairman. This is a development application lodged by the Brisbane Housing Corporation uh, for 32 affordable housing units, as they have delivered uh, already uh, so many housing, uh, housing options for people in this city that are affordable. Uh, this development application came to the committee. The site is 898 square metres, Mr Chairman. It is currently zoned high-density residential, up to 15 storeys. It adjoins a pre-1911 dwelling to the north, Mr Chairman. Uh, it is in 400 metres walking distance of six bus stops, 800 metres walking distance of the Baranda and Stones Corner busway stations and also the Baranda train station. Uh, this application was assessed by the council officers. Uh, there were a number of points that we uh, went through with the applicant because given that it was the Brisbane Housing Corporation and the nature of the development uh, that was being uh, proposed, uh, we wanted to make sure that they were uh, able to facilitate some of, and meet some of their requirements when it comes to providing affordable housing. So the actual building height itself is only nine storeys, even though they are able to go to 15 storeys. It covers 58 per cent site cover, Mr Chairman. Uh, there is uh, private open space as well as communal open space, which is provided for the residents living in this facility, Mr Chairman. Uh, so there is a range of different options for residents to interact and for those councillors that have had the benefit of touring a Brisbane Housing Corporation, a Brisbane Housing Company uh, site. Uh, there is uh, always in all of their um, uh, developments this great desire to make sure people are interacting who live in those developments. Uh, and so they've provided both the communal open space as well as the private open space. The deep planting requirements are over 15 per cent of the site, uh, Mr Chairman, and that was presented uh, by uh, Brisbane Housing Company as part of their solution to make sure that the site presents well and has fantastic amen amenity for the residents uh, that are living on this particular location. What Brisbane Housing Company has found is that the residents uh, that live in their facilities uh, have a very reduced reliance on motor vehicles. And so there is 12 car parks and one person with disabilities car park as part of this development and four visitor car parks, Mr Chairman. And there is 32 resident bicycle bays or spaces uh, and eight visitor spaces for bicycles as well, Mr Chairman. It was referred to the uh, Department of State Development, Manufacturing, Infrastructure and Planning for a referral given its proximity to uh, the motorway there, Mr Chairman. They provided a number of conditions back around noise mitigation, construction management and stormwater management. The committee uh, had a presentation from the council officers last week that went through a number of these issues. Uh, there was a series of questions that were asked uh, and uh, we voted on a committee, Mr Chairman, with uh, a unanimous support for the development coming forward uh, to full council today and I'd encourage all councillors to support the development application uh, as it stands. Uh, two petitions, Mr Chairman, um, on uh, Berylong Street uh, down there at Morningside, 133 Berylong Street in the subdivision of the land at 54 and 133 uh, Berylong Street. Mr Chairman, this matter is before the Planning and Environment Court uh, and as such I'm not really at liberty to say too much more. We'll, continuing to defend our decision to refuse this development application, Mr Chairman, uh, and we await the outcome of the court process, as we should do. Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Yes, thanks, uh, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, just uh, briefly, in relation to item A, uh, pleased to see a, uh, a uh, Brisbane housing project getting approved, and uh, all I can say is there should be more of them. There should be more of them around Brisbane. 
and uh, because uh, it, with uh, prices going up, it is very uh, difficult for a large section of our uh, community to be able to uh, afford to uh, to rent uh, in uh, in uh, Brisbane. And uh, this sort of affordable housing is really important for a large section of our community. In relation to items B and C, I just want to speak on that briefly. I did attend a public meeting of residents concerned about this development, and on the face of it, it looks a very bad development. It looks like a developer has managed to uh, buy land fairly cheap, near uh, quite close to a creek, quite flood-prone land, and the local residents aren't, aren't happy at all with the, uh, with the proposal. Council did knock the application back, and that's good, uh, but this petition calls for Council to uh, to be prepared to fight the matter all the way to court and not settle it at an early stage, for example, and, and give the uh, developer what they want, basically. So that's what the residents were concerned about. And uh, I'd hope that uh, the council would uh, stick to its guns and, uh, and continue to oppose this uh, development. Uh, I've got to say I'm a bit cynical about this. I think uh, if, uh, if uh, this was, uh, wasn't so close to an election, the council's attitude might have been a bit different. But, uh, but anyhow, I'd be... be, be, be uh, be uh, wary of my cynicism there, uh, anyhow. And it would be good. It would really be good if this uh, matter got to uh, a hearing and a judgment of the uh, planning court before the council election in March next year. That would be good to see that council had uh, uh, opposed the development all the way through and had gone to a trial. But we we'll wait to see what happens. Uh, we're prepared to accept the uh, the response that's been given by by council. I, I think the, the the response is a little bit misleading. It says. Before the court, you've, prepared to, you've got to follow the process, that's correct, but you can take into that process an attitude that we will not be settling this matter at an, at an early stage. We will not be allowing a, a subdivision of flood-prone land uh, or some compromise where they get you know, less blocks than they want uh, through, the, uh, through the appeal, but we will fight it all the way to the end and try to stop it happening altogether, which is what the approach that the residents want to see happen and which I think should happen. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Burke. Look, very quickly, Mr Chairman, there is a very clear process on how you have to deal with matters when they are referred uh, to the court, Mr Chairman. And Councillor Cummings' comments just then uh, scare me a little bit um, that uh, he seems to want to circumvent some of that pro process. He's trying to give uh, a direction that this should be brought forward and, and done. There is a process with the courts. We have to follow the statutory process and the laws outlined in the, in the State's Planning Act, in the Planning Act 2016, as it is called, when it comes to how you engage as part of the court process, Mr Chairman. Uh, Councillor Cummings' notion that, uh, that uh, they should try to circumvent that process uh, is not, I think, a very good outcome for the residents of Brisbane. Council has to go through this process. We have made a decision in refusing this development application. Uh, we are defending that in, in the court now. It's clearly outlined in the background for the residents to see there. And there is a process that has to be gone through as outlined in the Planning Act that is followed for all development applications, Mr Chairman, when they end up in court, whether it's an a, a refusal that's being challenged or an approval that's being challenged, Mr Chairman, uh, we have to go through that process. And I have great faith in the dedicated team of council officers that work in this space in the appeals unit who actually do the hard work of trying to defend these decisions that council has made. Thank you. Now, I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move the report for the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee held on Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019 be adopted. Seconded. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Hammond, seconded by Councillor Richards, that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019, um, be adopted. Is there any debate? No? Can, any other debate? Councillor Johnston. Oh, goodness me. Everybody must want to go home today. Uh, just briefly on the flood resilience uh, the flood, Brisbane's, building Brisbane's flood resilience. Um, this program uh, is problematic in my view in that it is only being given to a few wards um, and not those wards, not necessarily all of the wards that were badly flooded in 2011. Uh, Council initially started this program in Paddington and Inala and is now extending it to Wavell Heights 
and Camp Hill. Now, I don't remember Wavell Heights or Camp Hill being particularly badly flooded in 2011, um, and I am extremely concerned that those suburbs where we have independent engineering reports um, that were done by AECOM after the floods are not being prioritised for the delivery of this program. Um, AECOM did extensive um, engineering around uh, areas that experienced flooding and identified um, thousands of homes that suffer from both overland uh, flooding and backflow flooding. And it is inconceivable that the LNP um, is prioritising their own areas um, as opposed to uh, those in the, uh, in the AECOM reports out of the 2011 floods. Um, so there are areas in my ward that flood on a regular basis that are not eligible uh, for either buyback or this program. And this is where the problem arises. Now, to be fair to Councillor King, this is Councillor McLaughlin's own goal. Um, but I one of order. I'm sorry, Councillor Hammond. Thank I you. I apologise, Councillor Hammond. All right, thank you for uh, yep. that, Councillor Johnston. Um, to be fair to Councillor Hammond, this is Councillor uh, McLaughlin's own goal. Um, but when I have written asking for buyback for uh, residents in Yurong Pili, um, who were badly flooded in 2011 in historic years, and then experience regular ongoing flooding uh, when we have those really large rain events, um, Councillor McLaughlin wrote back to me saying they should go away and uh, take up the flood resilience program. Now, let's be clear, they're not eligible to. Yurong Pili is not included in the list of suburbs um, where uh, this is being rolled out. Another one was in uh, Yuronga, uh, sorry, in Corinda. Um, same letter from Councillor McLaughlin. Go away and look at the flood resilience program. It was only available when he wrote to me in Paddington and Anala, and now it's only available in Paddington, Anala, Wavell Heights and Camp Hill. Um, so I, I am extremely disappointed that this LNP administration would say something so nonsensical and wrong to residents, and I can tell you they're pretty angry, um, and to ignore the needs of those residents who uh, were flooded in 2011 and continue to experience localised flooding in heavy uh, storms. So either this program gets rolled out to everybody, which is the best way to do it, why aren't we just making all those people who are eligible um, able to apply? Because it is wrong, again, to seeing, see it being rolled out in LNP wards, and that's what's happening. Um, it, it's, just, it's just wrong to see that without it going into the suburbs um, where, uh, where the flooding is, is, is worst. And it's not just mine. There are other councillors who experienced really significant flooding in 2011 and who are not eligible for this program. So I say to the LNP, you have, if, if this program is useful, and we'll, we'll still got to see a little bit about that, I understand the spin, um, and I understand there's a few good individual cases, but if this program is useful, it is unreasonable and unfair that you are only providing it in a few suburbs and not providing it to all those who would be eligible, and particularly all those who experienced the traumatic event of 2011 and the annual ongoing flooding under their houses, through their houses, through their yards, um, that happens every year. And the only reason it hasn't happened so far this year is because we're in a drought. So I, I fear for residents in my area because the LNP is shut up shop and they will not listen to reasonable requests. Further speakers? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I'd like to welcome Councillor Cook and Councillor Strunk to the LNP um, because uh, there is four wards that have been approached for this pilot program, that which will continuously be rolled out, um, two um, on in LNP wards and two in the ALP wards. But I welcome you both if you want to jump over and see the, the right side of, of um, politics. However, um, I'd like to correct the record. Um, flooding hasn't got boundaries, ward boundaries, so flooding just does not happen in councillor um, the councillor for Tennyson's ward, it does happen in other parts of the city. Um, for example, in Rosalie and the Nala Council, which, which was the pilot, which was the start of this rollout, um, completed 150 home service initiatives in those areas. Um, in 
um, Wavell Heights. Um, there was 211 properties that were invited and 16 properties completed. This is an award-winning project uh, and pilot program with fantastic results from residents and comments from residents um, who were delighted to be a part of this. So I said this, pro this program will roll out to other wards. Um, and in closing, I would like to remind um, everybody in this chamber again that flooding does not know ward boundaries. Flooding unfortunately happens across our city, whether it's river, creek, or overland flow. This project is um, designed for overland flow um, flooding areas, um, and that's why those areas have been targeted. Um, and I know that Councillor Strunk was delighted with the program. I know that Councillor Matic was delighted with the program. And I also know um, that Councillor Adam Allen is in, um, really enjoying the, the part of this program. And I look forward um, when it continues to roll out in Councillor Cook's area to hear the positive comments um, from Councillor Cook about how wonderful this project, um, program is and how many residents it will help um, to get back on their feet more quickly. I commend the report. Thank you. I now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The country, no. The ayes have it. Councilor point of Cook. order. Point of order. Uh, yes, motion. thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I move that the motion for 67 uh, Chapman buyback of 67 Chapman Place, Corinda, be taken off the table. No. If, no. Yes, be taken off the table. Seconded. That's, thank you. That's, that's a, um, Oxley, actually. It's a procedural matter, so I will. Thank you. It's a procedural matter, so all those in favour of taking that item off the table, off the table right now, say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Uh, division. Division called by Councillor Johnston and Councillor Griffiths. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 19 against. The noes have it, please return to your seats. Councillors, the Field Services Committee. Councillor Howard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Field Services Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Marks. The report of the Field Services Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Howard. 
Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I'd just like to um, say that we had a very interesting presentation to the Field Services Committee last week from our Manager of Waste and Resource Recovery Services about the anniversary, the 30, 35th anniversary of the wonderful Brisbane wheelie bin. Um, it's, it's quite amazing to think that uh, prior to this, Brisbane residents were using 20-gallon trash cans, which had to be manually lifted into waste trucks during their, their collections. So uh, it, was a, it was a really interesting um, presentation, and I would sort of um, draw, draw the Chamber's attention that the presentation is up on ASEC docs, and uh, it really was something that uh, we all sort of went back down memory lane a little bit to sort of talk about some of the things that were happening in Brisbane Brisbane back uh, 35 years ago, but um, fantastic to see that uh, the, the history of waste services in this city as we move forward with newer, bigger and better improvements being delivered by Team Schrinner all the time. Um, this year we waived the establishment fee for green bins and that means that it's never been easier or more affordable to recycle our green waste and reduce waste to landfills. So I'd like to thank all our residents for their hard work in helping us fight the war on waste and I commend the report to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Howard. I now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee, please. Councillor Maddock. Mr Chair, I move the report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Maddox, seconded by Councillor Cunningham. The report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Maddock. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. There was one item, and that was the committee presentation on our aquatic centres. I'd like to thank the officers uh, for the presentation and their ongoing work uh, in regards to uh, upgrading our existing facilities. Um, as I said before, in the 1920 financial year, a new pool will open in Runcorn, and there'll be refurbish refurbishments occurring at the following sites at uh, Sandgate, Langlands, Musgrave Park, and Bell Barry. Um, it's important to that. Um, uh, we uh, uh, note the strong work of, uh, of the team in, in delivering these outcomes. And also, uh, I'd like to thank them for the video that they showed uh, in committee of the extensive amount of, extensive amount of work that's being undertaken at Langlands Pool. It was quite informative to see how much is actually occurring there. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Cunningham. Chair, I rise to speak on item A and the upgrade that's currently underway at Langlands Park Memorial Pool as discussed. Construction started in mid-August last year and has been completed in stages. The heated loan-to-swim pool has already been finished and the upgraded and repositioned 50-metre pool, new 25-metre pool and the aqua park are almost ready. I was on site twice last week and it's great to see the daily progress that is being made. Although the new water slide hasn't been completely finished, it was a bit of fun to be the first person down it last week. I also had the opportunity to meet Diana and Sile from a local business who were completing the special grouting work required for the pools. Diana and Sile told me that they both use this community facility with their sons, so they're delighted to be working on the project. Over the last few months, together with the lessee, I have been making plans for a community open day and I'm looking forward to welcoming the Lord Mayor to that in December. I want to thank the Lord Mayor and the Chair for the investment at this site, which will ensure it remains a key sporting and recreational precinct for our residents. The sensitive nature in the, in, the, in the way that it's been redeveloped maintains the site's heritage look and feel. Finally, I'd really actually just like to extend my thanks to Jan, the lessee. She pours her entire life into this facility. The love that Jan pours into the pool is returned in spades by the number of residents who use it, and I, it really makes it feel like a second home. So thanks to Jan and to the council officers for this project. Further speakers? Councillor Maddock? I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Finance and Administration Committee, please. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Finance and Administration Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019, be adopted. Seconded. 
It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor McLaughlin to the report of the Finance and Administration Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 22nd of October 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, last week in committee, we had a presentation on the uh, bus sale and leaseback program, which is uh, instrumental in financing and supporting our, uh, our fleet of buses in uh, Brisbane. Um, initially, the, uh, the presenter covered a little bit of the, uh, the history of our uh, council bus leasing program, and in particular, um, the providers of our leasing finance. Um, at present, we have um, two uh, banks who provide leasing facilities to us, being CBA and Westpac. And um, the current organisation that we use for bus leases is Westpac and uh, they've been our provider of lease finance since the 1st of July 2016. So at present we have buses leased with Westpac and CBA. Now the reason that council chooses to finance buses through, uh, through leasing is that it provides us with a uh, mechanism to reduce asset risk. Obviously with buses, technologies changing, technologies improving, and by having leases that allows us to manage the risk around, or the risk that would occur if you owned the buses. Uh, at present, Council has approximately 1,219 buses, of which 1,015 are financed by leases with Commonwealth Bank and Westpac. Um, at the end of each term, Council can choose to either purchase the, the asset or release it for a, a further period of time. Uh, under our agreement with TransLink, Council cannot lease buses beyond 21 years. Um, at present, Council uh, acquires approximately 60 rigid equivalent buses each year at a cost of approximately 490,000, and these are obviously uh, funded through our lease program with, with Westpac. And the current Westpac facility will expire on the 30th of June 2020, and prior to that expiry, we will be going to the market to uh, uh, seek um, further lease financing facilities on the most favourable terms available. Um, in terms of the market outlook for, um, for, for buses, I think at present we're purchasing diesel buses, but um, technology is changing rapidly, and we're seeing hydrogen and electric buses now available and hybrids, so uh, that will impact the, uh, the nature of the leasing arrangements that we enter into. Uh, but at any rate, certainly uh, Council is seen to be a good counterparty by uh, the key uh, lease financiers, and because of our um, standing with these finance providers, um, we get extremely good rates uh, for our leasing that um, reflect the, the, the risk to the financier, but also recognise the stature of council. Um, we also had during committee um, a regular report presented, the Bank and Investment Report, and I'll leave further debate to the chamber. Right, further speakers? There being none, Councillor Allen, I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any are there any petitions? Councillor Cunningham. Yes, I have a petition requesting uh, an increase in bus services for Langlands Park Station. Uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, yes, I have a petition for works on protected vegetation at 70 Quest Street, Macrovatis. Councillor Griffiths. Yes, yeah, just a petition for um, more parkland or conversion of road reserve to parkland in Marika. Councillor Atwood. I have a petition requesting council reject a proposed development at 33 Queensport Road, Murray. Any other petitions? May I please have a resolution? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richards, seconded by Councillor Griffiths, that the petitions as presented uh, be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, general business. Point of, point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Huang. Yeah, Mr Chair, I move a suspension of standing orders to allow me to move an urgency motion in relation to altering the commencement of the next ordinary council meeting. Seconded. I have an urgency motion being proposed uh, by Councillor Huang, seconded by Councillor Richards about the 
uh, commencement time of next week's council meeting. Is that correct? Yep, that's right. I have, uh, I, you have three minutes to urgency, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. As I have just outlined, this motion is straightforward. We have a long-standing tradition in this chamber of altering the commencement of the ordinary council meeting on a significant day of our, na of our nation's sporting calendar, the Melbourne Cup. Delaying Sorry. the start of the meeting by half an hour so, would so allow Council everyone to watch Huang, the race. I'm just, I'm just, I need you to speak to urgency for me, please. Yes, that's right. I'm coming to that. Yeah, why so, must we go with now? Yeah, because it is the last opportunity that we can uh, alter the time before the next Tuesday's meeting. And, uh, yeah, and this is a long-standing tradition of this chamber to delay the meeting for half an hour for um, the Melbourne Cup. So um, in here, I would like to move that this council alters the commencement time of the ordinary council meeting to be held on Tuesday, 5th of November 2019, from 2 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Seconded. Thank you. I will now, uh, move, uh, I will now put the, re uh, the resolution on the matter of urgency. All those who believe this matter is urgent say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. No. The ayes Division. Have it. Division by Councillor Cook and Division. Councillor Johnston. Ayes to my right, no's to my left. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 20 in favour and 7 against. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats. All right. Councillor Huang, can you please... Um, uh, I have the resolution moved by Councillor Huang, seconded by Councillor Richards, that next week's council meeting commence half an hour later than the ordinary time. Councillor Huang. Thank you, Mr Chair. It is fascinating that uh, we, we have to vote on the long-standing tradition of this country of uh, going to Melbourne Cup and uh, delay the uh, meeting for half an hour. But I think it is very clear that we, this council has done that for as long as I can remember I've been here. And uh, I think it is a great tradition that we should follow. So uh, I'll leave the debate to the chamber, and uh, I think it's a very Australian way to do things like this. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Mr Chairman. Um, firstly, can I say this is the first time in my memory that there's been an urgency motion uh, to change the meeting time of council. Um, it's not urgent, number one, as to when council starts, since, you know, I don't know, William Jolly was a boy, it's probably been 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And the Melbourne Cup's been running for, what, 150 years or something like that? And it's always the first Tuesday in September. So there's no urgency. November. November? November? I don't know. I don't follow the Melbourne Cup. Uh, so there's no urgency around um, there's no urgency around moving the starting time of the council meeting next week. This is just a plain stuff up by the LNP yes. who have forgotten to do a proper notice of motion, which is the way that they've done it in previous years. And they send poor old Councillor Wong out here uh, to, uh, to move this um, uh, amendment uh, motion to amend the starting time of council. In my yeah, yeah, sacrificial lamb is right. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cumming. Um, it's just not necessary. Um, you know, no one needs to stop the council meeting for the Melbourne Cup. Um, I don't have a big party. No one has a big party. If you guys are having a big party, you shouldn't be. So we should be in here working. Two o'clock's the time we're supposed to start. Um, I didn't support urgency, and I don't support the motion. Further speakers, Councillor Cook. Thank you, um, Mr Chair. My gosh, if this is the most urgent issue in the city today at this time, that is absolutely appalling. Yes. You've, every single year, this council prepares 
and puts up their uh, notice of motion. Yes. We don't agree that we should be stopping at 2 p.m. for Melbourne Cup. Our council workers, our hard-working council workers, right. of which there are almost 10,000, do not get to stop for the Melbourne Cup. Oh, I hear the Lord Mayor's interjecting. Apparently they do. Do they, Lord Mayor? So you give every council worker in this city, you've heard it first here today, folks, you can stop work, apparently, according yeah, to the yeah, Lord Mayor. Order. If yeah, you've got something please. to say about it, get up and say it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Once again, right. they totally show their true colours, Mr order. Chair. Okay, yep. Point of order. Councillor Cassidy, point of order to you. Will you um, pull up those councils on that side that just catcalled? Yeah. Councillor Cook, please. Everyone in here heard that. Everyone in here heard that. Oh, hang on, one at a time. And I'm wondering, Chair, whether you'll, whether you'll remind those on Absolutely. that side of the chamber. Um, we, this is a debating chamber where we will, where I have expected councillors would treat each other with courtesy. Noises such as that will not occur in this place again. Councillor Owen. They're not acceptable. Councillor Johnston. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order. Um, what started all that was the extremely loud interjections of the Lord Mayor repeatedly while Councillor Cook was speaking. As I have been warned um, yes, for interjecting, no, no, will no, you as you. well no, you've, you've warn the Lord Mayor? Um, as, I was, as I said, and as I've said many times today, I expect that councillors will be heard in silence. I'll be heard that I expect people will be treated with courtesy, um, both uh, audience and speakers. All right? So uh, I, I, want, I expect Councillor Cook to be heard in silence with courtesy, please. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair, for your protection. Um, we've seen that sort of behaviour in this chamber numerous times uh, in the two years that I've been here, and once again today, it's on display. When a woman in this place gets up and has something to say, the other side of the chamber can't handle it. Yes, we hear the shushing again. You know, I just don't know what it takes for this LNP administration to take what people on this side of the chamber have to say, and particularly women in this place, have to say seriously. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor. Uh, Deputy I Mayor. I believe Councillor Cook is imputing motive. Who okay, look. All right, here's what. Okay, stop. No, no more, inter no more interjections. Yeah. Councillor Cook. Mr. Chair. Can please accept my apology. Thank you. I should have kept that under control more. Please return to the substance. Thank you, Mr Chair. Of all the issues that are brought to this place each and every week, particularly the urgency motions in this place, that are voted down by the LNP as a block, today we have their true priorities on show for all of Brisbane to see. So you've heard it here, folks. Every council worker has heard it here first. You will apparently now have between 2 and 2.30 off. Congratulations. Uh, the Lord Mayor can get up and tell you that's not the case, but that's what he's just said here in the chamber today. Um, no one in this chamber needs to stop work for the Melbourne Cup, and this motion is an absolute farce. Further speakers. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. And the politicking on the race that stops the nation is an absolute farce. Council has started at 2.30 on Melbourne Cup Day forever, for the 12 years I've been here and for many, many, many years before. We apologise that this was not put up as a notice of motion earlier. It is not urgent because the content of the motion is urgent. We have left it till general business. The business of the day is complete. It is now the time for general business at the end of the meeting. This is the last opportunity to move this motion. That's why it's urgent. Last opportunity to move the motion. This is the race that stops the nation. It is something that we have always done. It is literally, we apologise again for not having it as a normal notice of motion. It has gone through every single year in the 12 years I've been here without debate, a standard procedural motion. Yes, 2.30 on the first Tuesday of November. And that's all that we have here before us today. We start at 2.30, we've seen the race, and we will continue until the meeting finishes on Tuesday night next week. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. 
Thanks, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak on this offensive motion before us today. Um, I don't think it will surprise anyone to know that I consider the Melbourne Cup an inhumane and cruel form of so-called entertainment. I think it's deplorable that um, we celebrate the mistreatment and abuse of animals in this way. Um, and I think it's particularly shameful that we would purport to um, delay or hold off on council business simply to, to glorify in that abuse and mistreatment. I know um, other people might take a different view of this, but plainly there is a lot of um, concern about the mistreatment of um, horse races in our society at the moment. That was quite obvious after the recent Four Corners documentary. Um, and I, I think this administration may be out of step with the expectations of a significant proportion of the citizenry. I'm not saying with the majority of the citizenry. I'm, I'm not pretending that um, the vast majority of, Mel of Brisbane residents are, are opposed to the Melbourne Cup yet. But I, I think that mood is shifting in the public realm. And I don't think it's appropriate for us to be holding up a council meeting simply to watch a horse race. I think there are, there are many important occasions and events that might justify postponing or delaying or rescheduling a council meeting, but watching animals get whipped and, and raced around a track um, in such cruel and inhumane conditions is certainly not one of them. And I think it's shameful and embarrassing that this is the one thing that we are willing to delay a council meeting for. Um, I think it reflect, reflects quite poorly on the administration that um, they're bringing an urgency motion about this. I, I take the point that just because something's brought as an urgency motion doesn't necessarily mean imply that the content is especially urgent. But it is interesting to me that this council administration frequently argues that it doesn't have time to discuss certain issues and votes down urgency motions on a range of issues that I would consider to be urgent. Um, and yet here we have an attempt to um, bring forward a motion simply to delay a council meeting so they can have a punt on cruelty. And I think, um, I think there are a lot of people around Brisbane who would be disappointed to see that this is the way elected councillors who are paid very generously decide to spend their time. Um, I, I would be surprised to learn that the bus drivers stop for the race. I'd, I'd be surprised to learn that essential workers and, and core employees of council stop for the race. May, maybe they do, or may, maybe I'm wrong, but I'd be surprised to learn that. But if they're working, I don't see why we shouldn't be working. I don't see why um, councillors who are very well paid and who are elected to do a job should take an extra long lunch break and have a little party in the middle of the day um, just because that's what we've always done. The argument that something is tradition or something, that something has been done for a long time is not a sufficient justification in and of itself to continue doing something. I have a great deal of respect for tradition and ritual. I think it's an important part of culture. But when a tradition is cruel, when a tradition causes unnecessary suffering, it's time to critically reflect on that tradition and consider whether we might move away from that. The evidence is very clear now. Um, it's well documented that horse racing causes harm and that the industry doesn't value animals and treat them with the dignity that they deserve. And it's time now for us to seriously reflect on whether this is something we want to endorse and support or whether this is something that we would move away from supporting. And I, I think it's, um, it, all, all I'm saying is that let's not stop the meeting. How about that? Let, let's do that as a start. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here today saying that um, Every, every councillor who, who wants to watch the race is an evil person or that everyone who has a bed is, is inhumane or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that at the very least, let's, let's just do our job. Let's just keep working um, and, and not delay a meeting for this kind of cruelty. Further speakers? Councillor Huang. Thank you, Mr Chair. This motion was moved in respect of a, a good, proud tradition of this nation with a sporting event that is celebrated nationwide. So I can't see why there are councillors getting emotional in this discussion. And, uh, and look, I think it is, um, if there's any emotion, it should be a cheerful celebration to celebrate the uh, a nationwide tradition 
that's going to bring this country together. So I'm proud to move these motions and uh, commend the motion to the chamber and ask all council to support this nationwide motion. Thank you. All, right. all those in favour of the resolution say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. 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 Councillor Cook, uh, Councillor Johnston. Ayes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 20 in favour and 7 against. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. Point of order. Point of order. Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I uh, seek to suspend so much of standing orders uh, to enable me to move an urgency motion calling on Council to undertake a comprehensive audit of all Brisbane's character pre-46 homes and ensure they're protected under city plan. Um, Seconded. We, there's been resolutions on this topic a number of times, and I recall one very recently. Excuse me. Yeah, look. Let me just just bear with me, but because I do I do recall that this has been this has been discussed in recent weeks. Um, well, point of order, Mr. Well, this Chairman. This matter was dealt with last week. Can you allow me to finish? Oh. Because you never know. You know, you never know. <laughs> this resolution was dealt with last week, and it was, um, it was rejected at that time. However, it is my view that the resolution is not about the substantive, but rather the matter of urgency. I will accept the urgency resolution, but I will not. I will not accept. You're bringing it back again. I will view that as a deliberate time-wasting time technique. All right. So you have three minutes of urgency on this matter. I'm sorry. Can you just be a bit clearer about what you've said there? I'm a bit. Um, I said that you can move your urgency motion if you wish. Excuse me. So I've actually moved that we overturn standing orders to yep. enable me to move. I'm a not motion. sure if you. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you understand, but I've said please proceed. Yes. That's what I've said that like three times. I appreciate sometimes you don't um, you don't appreciate when things go your way, but I no. often make make rulings in your favour. I did not Please hear proceed what you said, with your resolution. The clarification. As I say, oh, I make no. rulings in your favour constantly. Please proceed. Oh yeah, right. Uh, okay, so 
Um, uh, I'm moving this motion today because it continues to be urgent. The LNP have rejected at every opportunity um, brought to this council over the past few years uh, by myself and the Labor Party uh, to ensure all pre-1946 homes and character are uh, pre-46 homes are protected and preserved under the Judicial Building um, Overlay Code and under City Plan 2014. Um, we must undertake an audit to ensure that they are all protected. Um, we've seen today what the LNP considers to be urgent. That is stopping the business of this council uh, so they can watch a horse race on TV. More urgent, I would suggest, is that pre-46 homes around this city remain at risk from demolition because the LNP refuses to identify and map them. Now, I have raised this issue uh, with council officers. I have raised it with successive Lord Mayors. I have written to the, other, uh, the new Lord Mayor uh, about this today. I have uh, raised this through DA objections. I've moved motions in this council chamber over many years now, and it is unreasonable that significant character homes in this city are being lost. If it is urgent that the business of council stops as the LNP wants, so that they can have a party and watch a horse race, it is equally urgent that this city undertakes a comprehensive audit to protect pre-1946 homes. And I all urge all councillors to vote for the urgency motion before us today, because surely protecting our character pre-46 homes is equally or more urgent than watching the Melbourne Cup. Uh, on the matter of urgency, all those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Johnston. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 20 against. The noes have it. Please return to your chairs. Hey. All right. Councillors, are there any statements required as a result of a councillor conduct review panel order? There does not appear to be any. Councillors, are there any matters of general business? I would like to acknowledge that it's Councillor Lander's first or maiden speech, and uh, both as a courtesy and the rules insist that she will be heard in silence. Welcome, Councillor Landers. Thank you, Chair. I am delighted, honoured and proud to address the council chamber today as the new councillor for Brackenridge Ward. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What big shoes I have to fill. My predecessor, Amanda Cooper, has been an inspirational and effective advocate for the suburbs of Brackenridge, Bald Hills, Castledine, Fitzgibbon, Aspley and Zilmia since 2007. Yeah. Everywhere I go in Brackenridge Ward, Locals and community leaders continue to sing her praises because she has listened to them and worked with them to make Brackenridge Ward the best place to live, work and raise a family. As part of Team Schrinner, Amanda has achieved so much, from parks and street upgrades to improved transport. She has listened and delivered. I commit today to continue that legacy of delivering across my ward. Amanda's work in our local community is not finished, and I look forward to working with her when she becomes the state member for ASPLE in October 2020. Yeah. I am so honoured to be part of Team Schrinner, 
and intend to work with our Lord Mayor Adrian Schooner and our great team of councillors to make them proud and achieve for my community. In particular, my Northside colleagues Fiona Hammond and Tracy Davis, who I will be working alongside, particularly with our shared suburb of Aspley. Mr Chair, what a privilege it is to represent the community I grew up in. To have the honour of working in grassroots politics in my grassroots. I'm a Brisbane girl who has always called the North Side home. I went to school at Brackenridge State High School and from there to university to become a teacher. My first practice teaching was at Aspley State High School before I headed west to Aramac and then Mackay. Thirteen years later, I returned home to the north side of Brisbane, where I taught at Craigslea and Albany Creek State High Schools. My children, Courtney and Jordan, attended St Paul's School from 2003 to 2009. Courtney has recently returned from Cambridge University with a PhD in pathology and works at the University of Tasmania. Jordan finished his final assessment on Friday to complete his honours in psychological science at the University of uh, Queensland. Jordan has been working in disability support and healthcare since 2008, when he began a school-based traineeship in nursing at the Jakarta Acquired Brain Injury Centre in Brackenridge. I'm very happy to say he has been offered and accepted a place in the EY graduate program in 2020. Courtney and Jordan make me a proud mum every day and they are my greatest achievement. I want to take a moment to acknowledge Kayla and Hayley, who I am so fortunate to have in my ward office. I know, <clears throat> I know Amanda would like me to pass on her sincere thanks to them for their drive and commitment to the residents of Brackenridge Ward, who also sing their praises. Mr Chair, I have so much to do and a vision for making Brackenridge Ward even better than it is today. One of my core values is the development of community. Wherever I have lived, I have done my best to build on that community. From volunteering my time and energy to playgroups, schools, scouts, music and community groups, to being a JP and to rolling up my sleeves with the hundreds and hundreds of other Brisbaneites as part of the Mud Army when the devastating floods affected our great city. Other than bringing my children into the world, by far the most rewarding thing I have ever done was to foster children. I encourage those who are in any way inclined or considering becoming a foster parent, please take the plunge. You will never regret it. I want to acknowledge and pay tribute to the extraordinary Louise and Ken Fluggy. Ken was a bus driver for Brisbane City Council for 25 years, based at Tawong Depot. The wonderful Fluggy family have cared for and loved over 100 children in my community and given them a greater chance in life. Unfortunately, Ken is no longer with us, but his wife Louise, who is a most beautiful soul, continues to make a difference in the lives of vulnerable families, making our community so much better. Mr Chair, I see my role now as the councillor for Brackenridge Ward as the spokesperson for my community. I will be available and I will listen. My community are my eyes and ears, and together we can deliver on outcomes to constantly keep building on our great ward in Brackenridge. The recreation hub that Amanda envisioned in her maiden speech has well and truly progressed under this administration. I want to continue with that vision and build upon the activities and facilities already in this precinct so that Rogan Road Fitzgibbon and Telegraph Road Brackenridge are united by bike paths and walkways and form the hub, form the heart of my community. The infrastructure we have delivered is not only in parks and green space. The LNP administration has delivered major road projects such as the replacement of the Telegraph Road open level crossing, as well as a major upgrade of the road through Bracken Ridge to the Gateway Motorway, including the replacement of the former roundabout and widening of Lemke Road. 
But while we have delivered new infrastructure in the suburbs of Brackenridge Ward, there are some major infrastructure projects that have been ignored by the state government. Council has committed $40 million towards removing the open level crossing at Beams Road. And all this state government can do is procrastinate and stall so we, <clears throat> with so-called feasibility studies. We know what the problem is. We know what needs to be done to fix it. So let's get on with it. This Labor state government needs to come clean on another project in my ward that is long overdue. The Linkville Road overpass duplication. Claims from this Labor state government <clears throat> to provide funding for this project are hollow, as there is no funding in the forward estimates. They need to stop playing politics and get the job done. Yeah, yeah. Mr Chair, you can't do this job without the support of your family behind you. And I have one of the best. My mum, Joan, brothers, Stephen and Craig, and sister, Karen. My brother-in-law, Jeff, and sisters-in-law, Christine and Grace. My nieces and nephews, Christopher, Justin, Adrian, Jesse, Victoria, Amy and Tegan, and their partners, Tracy, Emma and Sean, and my great nephew and niece, Balin and Charlie. Even though my amazing dad, Des, is no longer with us, I feel his guidance and love every day, and I can hear him saying, go get him, girl. And to my friends, I've been so very blessed on this journey to have such dear friends. They have taught me so much and influenced the person I am today. I don't want to leave anyone out, so I'm not going to name them. However, they know who they are and they know how grateful I am for their support and love. I want to thank my LNP family who worked so hard, campaign after campaign for our great party. The LNP with its values of family, small government, free enterprise and sound economic management, working hard to secure the future of our children and their children. And the greatest bonus has been the friendships forged along the way. I want to acknowledge one of my mentors and friends, Peter Dutton, who has always backed me and taught me so much. Thank you also to another mentor and friend, Tim Mander, who has given me the courage and confidence to take on this new and important challenge. I would not be standing here today without them. I want to thank the Lord Mayor, Adrian Schrinner, my fellow councillors, and the incredible team in the office of the Lord Mayor who worked so hard behind the scenes to get things done. You have been so welcoming, and I look forward to working alongside you as a member of Team Schrinner to make sure that the Brisbane of tomorrow is even better than the Brisbane of today. Yeah. Congratulations and welcome, Councillor Landers. Are there any further matters of general business? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Listen, I just want to rise and speak about a particular event that happened last Friday in my ward. Uh, we, um, there was a small, uh, small business uh, expo held um, by, the, um, by the Small Business Expo Group, um, uh, headed up by uh, Paula Brand. Um, and uh, uh, when I was first approached uh, by Paula some months ago, um, she explained to me what the, what the expos were about um, and what, what goals she wanted to achieve um, for those small businesses in my area and, uh, and, and, and outside my area as well. Um, I was quite impressed actually with her presentation. She obviously lives and breathes small business, uh, something that I could, I could relate to uh, in my uh, almost three decades of, uh, of, of retail. And um, so we spoke about uh, a number of things, uh, another positive things that, we, that I, I would like to see with, with small business and being able to network the, uh, the, the businesses in my ward as well. Uh, and that's basically what the expos are, are about in a, in a lot of respects is, is that network, networking, the understanding of, of what maybe your competitors are doing uh, but they're, they're really, sometimes your competitors turns out to be, uh, to be your friends actually. Um, and uh, because uh, you can learn from one another. And uh, so it's really good just to see that exchange that was happening uh, last Friday. Um, it was opened by the, uh, 
the Minister for Small Business, uh, uh, Minister Fenneman, and, um, and she, she uh, obviously has traveled extensively around Queensland um, talking to small businesses. So she had some really great insights into uh, what small businesses uh, are looking for uh, by way of support. Um, we also, of course, had Jess Pugh, the uh, state member for, uh, um, for um, uh, Mount Albany, um, um, that came across as well. Uh, and of course, uh, she has a, a small business uh, award, uh, a business awards that, that she holds every year as well. So she had a great deal of interest in what was happening uh, at the expo. Um, also, of course, uh, the former councillor uh, uh, for Richens uh, and now a federal member uh, uh, for Oxley, Milton Dick was there as well. And again, uh, he's been doing some work with small business as well um, in, in his work down in Canberra. Um, so he had some further insights as well. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was really um, glad to see that this expo was held at a really great uh, a venue, um, the Lighthouse in Woogaroo Street, which is just tailor-made for holding an expo like this, which had 145 exhibitors and over 1,000 professionals there, um, all gathering to, uh, to show their wares, uh, talk to people who of, of interest uh, from the community that uh, came along. It was a really busy, busy day. Um, it was, uh, the, and the park, they, they did the parking pretty right. This was the first time that this had been held uh, in my ward uh, at this venue and parking was uh, an issue that I, I thought may be a big one, uh, but they, um, the organizers handled that quite well and Brisbane City Council was open to some suggestions of, some, uh, of, of opening up some space for uh, e uh, extra parking as well, which worked out quite well. Um, I just uh, commend uh, um, Paula and, uh, and the work she does with her team right around uh, Southeast Queens Queensland on these expos, uh, because I think it's, uh, really, uh, it's really good to so sort of see someone within the industry um, undertake this work. Uh, it shouldn't all be about uh, what government uh, does, uh, because the industry, I think, can actually do it so much better. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further speakers for the general business. There being no one raising it to their oh, Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I rise to speak on a couple of items, uh, in particular green space and, and sustainable planning. Um, I was interested in the Lord Mayor's comments earlier today in response to my question about public green space. And I hope um, these comments will be relayed to the relevant parks planners within the news team as well, and that they'll um, pipe the attention of Councillor Hammond. The dominant thinking within the council administration at the moment seems to be that in, in inner city areas, it's very, very expensive to acquire land for new public park land. So instead of creating new public parks, we're just going to spend as much money as we can on upgrading the additional facilities to make them more usable and to get better value out, out of them. Now, I actually agree with the Lord Mayor that um, there are certain public spaces in my ward, such as obviously South Bank Parklands um, and even Captain Burke Park, that are very well maintained and they're, they're great parks. Um, locals love them and they're also well attended by people from right across the city. But there are also other, quite a couple of other parks in my ward that actually don't get very much investment at all. And um, they certainly don't fit the stereotype of high quality inner city parks that um, some councillors seem to adhere to. But more to the point is the fact that, that because those few inner city parks like South Bank are so well loved by the entire city, they play a, a very different role compared to local green space that might be used for residents who just want a quiet place to have a picnic or connect with nature. And I think the Lord Mayor and perhaps the relevant chairs have misunderstood how important public green space is for residents, particularly those who live in smaller inner city apartments and don't have their own private green spaces. So we're talking about residents who might live in apartments that are only 50 square metres. That's their entire private space. They don't even have a proper balcony. They don't have a shared courtyard. The some of the projects that have been approved in recent years in Brisbane um, are extremely light on in terms of private open space. And so that means these residents are very, very dependent on public spaces for recreation and just, just to be able to get away and have a third place, as it were, between work and home. And I'm concerned that the mayor seems to be dismissing or downplaying this need when he 
talks in vague terms about um, improving the usability of public spaces and dismisses questions about um, square meterage of public parklands. Because yes, you're, you're right through you, Mr. Chair, that not, um, not all parks are, the, are of the same value and that two parks of a similar area might get very different levels of use. But as a general proposition, it's now indisputable that on a per capita basis, inner city suburbs like Woolloongabba and West End are chronically underserved in terms of public parkland. This isn't just a matter of a few square metres. This is a matter of hectares and hectares, where people who don't have their own backyards, who don't have private green spaces, who live in very close quarters with their neighbours, and even if they want to just have a, have a party um, or, or a, a small celebration, can't, can't do it in their own private residences. These residents do not have access to enough public green space. And this problem is only going to become more acute because this administration has upzoned a significant number of sites around the inner city for further high density development, but has not zoned any sites for more public parkland. So it, it would be another matter, perhaps, if the administration was saying, yes, yes, we've upzoned all these sites for high rise towers, but we have, we've also upzoned this site and this site and this site for more parkland. But in my entire electorate um, of the Gabba Ward, the only site that's really been talked about as new public parkland is Carl Street, um, the Carl Street Park down in Baranda, which is actually going to be um, rezoned out, out of the Gabba Ward at, at the next electoral boundary redistribution anyway. So we're very, very light on in public parks in the inner south side. And I'm very concerned that the mayor doesn't seem to appreciate how significant this problem is. I want to emphasize that, yes, it's good to put a bit of money into upgrading public spaces, but there's only so much you can do to a public space before it just becomes more and more cluttered. And what residents are telling me they need is more open space to kick a ball around, to throw a frisbee, maybe to fly a drone perhaps, um, and particularly to walk their dogs. Um, there's a real concern now that the, there's not enough dog off leash facilities in the inner south side. Um, West End only has two very, very small dog off leash facilities. In fact, one is more within the suburb of South Brisbane. So those two small dog off leash facilities are now catering for somewhere in the range of 20,000 residents. And I really want to emphasize they're like the size of a basketball court. So, for the mayor to say that we're going to continue to upgrade existing parks and ensure parks are getting better used without acknowledging that on some level it does actually come down to square metres and the area of, of usable parkland is very, very concerning. Um, and I, I really want to implore the mayor to recognise that what this administration is doing at the moment is, setting, is, is a step backwards for this city. Because right now you're not dealing with the ramifications, but in a few years we will be. And at that point, all the residents who've moved into these recently approved high rises will be saying, well, where's the parks? Where are the community facilities? Why weren't these facilities planned ahead for um, at the time that all this upzoning occurred? And the particularly acute problem is that because this council has upzoned so much land, land values have risen astronomically, which makes it more and more difficult for local council or the state government to acquire land for parkland. And that, that's only going to get harder and harder over time. So the message from the community, the message from local urban planners and facilities planners who understand these issues is that the sooner you acquire more land for new public parkland, the better. The longer you put it off, the more expensive it is going to become. And so if, if the mayor and if the chair and if the deputy mayor are saying, no, 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 we don't need any new parks in West End. We don't need any new parks in South Brisbane or in Woolloongabba. That is extremely concerning. But it's almost as bad if you're simply saying, yes, yes, we know we need new parks, but we're going to give them to you in a few years. Because the longer you wait, the more expensive it will become. I, I'm really frustrated and concerned that this message is not cutting through. I'm troubled um, by the mayor's dismissiveness. I'm worried that um, the administration is neglecting this issue and doesn't understand the needs of residents who live in high dense inner city areas. I'm worried that councillors who largely represent low rise suburban areas where residents have backyards and have access to broader green spaces don't understand how bad this issue is in the inner south side and in other parts of the inner city. 
Um, we don't even have a soccer field for, for the West End Foot Soccer Club. They, they don't have a field. They, they're ready, they want one, they need one, but we literally have one, um, one com community lease sports field, that's the Davies Park, which the South League Rugby League Club have. That's the only sports field in, for West End South Brisbane. There's an, an informal open space in Musgrave Park that gets a lot of heavy use. And then there's the Dutton Park Primary School Oval, which is essentially fu functioning as another public space. But we're really low on public open spaces in the inner south side. I'm not talking about dinky little spaces where people might gather for a, for a barbecue or um, might meet briefly for an event or whatever. I'm talking about open green spaces where you can stretch your legs, where you can kick a ball, um, where you can fly a kite. And if this administration is serious about pursuing a strategy of over-densification and cramming thousands of additional residents into the inner city, then you need to make inner city life livable. You need to ensure that people who move into these high density apartments have access to public facilities that offset the fact that they have very small private homes. If you don't do that, you're gonna have a difficult problem convincing people that inner city living is an attractive option. This is gonna have a range of flow on negative impacts in terms of demographic shifts, in terms of property values, and in terms of a sense of connected community and strong culture. I know it might seem um, like this is a luxury issue or a trite issue to be talking so much about public parkland, but I actually think it goes to the core of what we mean when we talk about a good life. Um, and particularly, I'm concerned about the most vulnerable members of our society who rely most heavily on these public parks and green spaces. And so I'm saying through you, Chair, to the Lord Mayor, do not ignore this issue. Do not downplay or minimise it. Do not offer excuses about, oh, it doesn't matter how many square metres the, the green space is, what people want is the facilities. What people need is the facilities and the green space. It shouldn't be one or the other. Um, I've identified numerous sites within my ward, and I've emailed that list to multiple chairs of news over the years that could be acquired for public parkland. I've identified sections of road reserve that could instead be converted into public parkland. And the fact that this administration has been so slow to act Council is Council deeply Shree, concerning. Your time's expired. Further matters of general business. Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Mr Chairman. The people of Doughboy Ward are getting to know that I am a person of action. I much prefer to be delivering on what the locals of my community actually Point of order. want. Point of More order. listening and less... Johnston. Sorry. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Um, you might just let Councillor Atwood know. She needs to say what she's speaking about. Oh, look. Councillor Atwood, typically um, a speaker is required to outline the topics by which that they intend to speak in their general business. So if you wouldn't mind just one yeah, or two I'll seconds. I'll be speaking that, about Keanua Park upgrade and also Mayfield's donation to Stanthorpe. Thank you. So um, the only time it is as counterintuitive is in this place where I'm happy and relish in the opportunity to talk about the good people of Doughboy Ward. So today I wish to recognise that because of the strong financial management of our great city, we are able to make substantial investments and upgrades to facilities desired by our residents. Last Saturday, I hosted my first cinema in the suburbs at Keanawa Park. I love bringing our suburbs together, meeting locals and speaking with them. It was a great opportunity for me to engage with local families who will be enjoying this new playground and discuss with them four different design options. Mr Chairman, more listening and less talking leads to quicker decisions that reflect the wishes of the community. Speaking of action, Mr Chairman, action is what the students of Mayfield State School in Carina um, are taking to to support their fellow students in drought-stricken uh, Stanthorpe. Mayfield and State, Stanthorpe State School are similar in size. The students of Mayfield State School have become aware that if it doesn't rain, lots and lots, very soon, Stanthorpe will run out of water. The students of Mayfield State School wanted to do something of real assistance. Whilst they had a lot of very good ideas, they decided to talk to the local principal. Mrs Joanne Posse, principal of Stanthorpe State School, relayed that with a lack of water, many of the farms aren't producing crops this year. Stockmen are selling their breeding stock, jobs are drying up, and many residents under, are under extreme financial pressure. As such, Mr. Po Mrs Posse suggested the collection and donation of stationary supplies would be a very practical, practical uh, donation for the students of Mayfield State School in Carina to make. As a former Stanthorpe local myself, I am incredibly moved and so proud of the 
uh, practical action that has been undertaken by the students and the wider Mayfield State School community. I have thrown my full support behind this appeal and invite the residents of Doughboy to get involved. As well as the school, my office at Cannon Hill is a collection point, and I look forward to driving out to Stanthorpe soon with Mayfield State School to deliver the donated goods. In addition to the practical support um, through the collection drive, I am delighted to share with the Chamber that Mayfield students are sending the Stanthorpe students a card with a note. This gesture of good wishes and empathy will be immensely positive on the well-being of the young people in Stanthorpe. Just when I thought I could not be more prouder or enthused to be serving the people that live and contribute across the suburbs of Doughboy Ward, I am. Thanks to this latest demonstration of the good hearts that beat in Doughboy. Thank you. Further general business, Councillor Davis. Oh, well, thank you, Chair. I rise to speak about one of uh, McDowell Ward's uh, most iconic community assets, uh, which has been part of the local la uh, landscape for almost 60 years, and that's the much-loved Everton Park Library. Uh, by way of history, and I thank uh, the library staff for providing me with this, the library first opened its doors on the 5th of June 1965, uh, and it was Council's 15th library. Uh, the library site had previously been occupied by the Everton Park Progress Hall, which we think uh, was constructed sometime around 1919 or 1920. But in 1963, the trustees of the Progress Association Hall um, approached um, uh, local alderman Roy Harvey, uh, offering to transfer the land free of charge to council as long as the council erected a library on the site and the hall was relocated. Uh, and given that the site was close to local shops, uh, the uh, council agreed to, uh, to build the library. So the hall was uh, relocated to Parkland in Fallon Street uh, in June 1964, following an ENC approval for the library uh, to be erected on site. And the original Fallon Cottage was later also relocated to the park in 1992, and it's still there today. Plans for the library were drafted by the council architect in May 1964, and construction commenced in June 1964. Uh, a little fun fact about, um, about the library. It was the first council library to be opened with a microfilm photo charger machine uh, to film and record loans in operation. Other libraries um, didn't get a machine until uh, much later and they were retrospectively installed. Um, the library uh, has been um, extended and refurbished both in 1977 and 1994. Uh, and today the library is is one of the smaller libraries in the city with a size of 454 square metres. It does, though, punch well above its weight. Um, it sees almost 48,000 visitors uh, per year and more than 7,000 people attend learning programs per year. Uh, so, Mr Chair, although uh, the library has served our community well, it's time we consider what um, the future looks like for the library, given that our community is growing. Uh, and we need to be looking about what a library can provide the community in the future. So recently, um, I've been out and about in the community holding some um, mobile offices in Everton Park uh, to consult with local residents about their vision for the library. And it was quite wonderful to hear some of the stories uh, about uh, how residents had used the library in the past and what they saw for the future. And at Brookside, I met a lovely grandmother who um, who took her children to the library. Um, she doesn't live in the area anymore, but she does come back twice a week to uh, visit with her grandchildren and look after them. Uh, and she wants uh, the Everton Park Library to be expanded so it's a more contemporary library so that her grandchildren can enjoy that experience, just as her own children enjoyed what was then a contemporary library uh, when, they were, when they were younger. Um, I had a wonderful conversation with another resident who uh, came specifically to talk to me about the library. And what was particularly special about that was that this resident um, has macular degeneration, so it's actually a bit um, of an effort for her to come and have that conversation. But uh, she's so passionate about uh, libraries being such an important community hub uh, that she came along to have a chat to me and talk about the wonderful library staff that she had come in contact with, not only at Everton Park Library, but now as her um, disease is to a point where she is legally blind, uh, she's able to access um, uh, uh, the audio book uh, library. Uh, I think it might have even been from Mitchelton that she told me about. Uh, and so she's able to still enjoy 
listening to stories rather than reading them uh, hard copy. Um, it's been fantastic to speak to young parents uh, who take their children to the library and they tell me how their children uh, enjoy the experience very much. But as I said, it's a small library and by expanding it would mean that there's more opportunity uh, for uh, more spaces for learning for the children and also an expanded uh, children's section uh, and also uh, some reading programs. Uh, we have Fallon Park, as I mentioned, behind the library, uh, and many of the young parents feel that it would be a wonderful opportunity to upgrade Fallon Park and make it part of an expanded library precinct, and I think uh, that would be a great, um, a great idea. Uh, we do have a challenge in the McDowell Ward where we are short of meeting spaces, and an expanded library would provide the community uh, groups in our local area opportunity to meet. Uh, at the at the library with um, you know well equipped meeting rooms um, after hours access for them uh, for those community groups. Uh, Chair, as I said, um, it's a small library, uh, punching well above its weight. Uh, wonderful staff, a wonderful feel, but it is time that we look to the future. And it's been fantastic to be out into the community, uh, listening to people about their aspirations for their local library, and I look forward to working with them uh, and supporting uh, our petition to upgrade what is a wonderful, iconic feature in the McDowell landscape. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I rise um, not to make a general business speech, but to give a personal explanation. Mr Chair, earlier uh, this evening there were um, comments made that there was a cat call made from this um, side of the chamber. Um, when Councillor Cook was um, speaking earlier and started raising her voice and, and was uh, quite irate, I sat here and said, wow, quite loudly. It may have been misinterpreted by those on the other side of the chamber. When you were dealing with the matter, Mr Chair, I did rise and I was going to give a personal explanation at that time. However, I chose to allow the decorum of the chamber to settle down and to allow you the courtesy of managing the chamber in your right as chair of this uh, chamber. Um, if there was any offence taken to the wow that I um, enunciated from this side of the chamber by those on the opposite side, I apologise. And um, should that um, continue um, to offend, I will personally apologise to Councillor Cook if she feels that it was something other than what it was. But I clearly did say wow, because I was um, astounded by the way she um, was speaking to the Lord Mayor at that time. So, um, Mr Chairman, um, for the benefit of this chamber, I rise to, to give this personal explanation. I apologise to the chamber if um, it caused any disruption at that time. Thank you. For the speakers. Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to uh, speak on a few events recently in the Gap Ward, one being the uh, celebration of Soane's uh, 25th and the other, the Urala Street Community Kitchen. Uh, Mr Chair, a couple of weeks ago, um, we celebrated the 25th year of Soane, uh, again, which for the benefit of the Chamber and the new councillors is Save Our Waterways Now an organisation that was founded in the Gap Ward uh, by a previous councillor of this chamber, Councillor Brian Hallen, at the time. Uh, he was also a predecessor of yours, Chair, as Chairman of the, the Council, and a uh, staunch Liberal supporter of Sally Ann Atkinson. Mr Chair, we actually had Brian uh, on, on site uh, for this celebration, uh, where Soane had set themselves the task of planting over 2,500 plants in Watonga Park. Uh, I'm told by uh, residents that are around Watonga Park uh, that before the first planting, which happened in this park in 2002, uh, the residents could send their, their kids off to Hilda Road State School and see them walk straight into the gate. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's a much different story. Uh, the park is now surrounded by trees in excess of nine to 10 metres, uh, and there's lush vegetation growing in the undergrowth. Uh, we had uh, one of our long-standing friends, Derek uh, Sandy, do a welcome to country. Uh, Derek has been doing welcome to countries uh, in the ward for a long, long time, and I'll take that interjection, Councillor Hammond. He is amazing. 
He is absolutely amazing. And uh, Derek is always welcome anytime uh, in the Gap Ward. Uh, we also had a number of community groups uh, join us. And I'm happy to say that a lot of community groups within the Gap Ward are actually starting to work uh, together and form a common bond and a common goal around many of the tasks that they have. We had the Lions and the Leos uh, from Ashgrove the Gap. Uh, they did all the cooking for the day and I thank the Lord Mayor because most of the food was supplied by the Lord Mayor's Community Benefit Fund for the morning. So we actually did a bit of planting, a bit of watering and a bit of a sausage sizzle. Uh, Mr Chairman, we also had um, Mott on site as well and as many in this chamber would know, Men of the Trees is an international organisation uh, tasked with uh, planting trees uh, where they can. Uh, and they're a great group. Uh, many of the members of Mott have been participating uh, in rehabilitation and revegetation across this great city for many, many years. Uh, we also had the Hilda Road uh, State School PNC. Now, for those in the chamber, Hilda Road PNC have a subcommittee called Fish Creek 4061, which is a wonderful little community group that's re vegetating along Fish Creek, along uh, the school boundary, and they are doing fantastic work uh, with the support of council as well. Uh, we had the Wacky Wildlife Sisters, which are a couple of, couple of students from Hilda Road State School. Uh, they've taken it upon themselves to, um, and rightly so, do a bit of a clean up, educate the community around wildlife in the local area, and uh, the sisters did a fantastic job. Uh, I would like to acknowledge a couple of council officers, uh, Andrew and Jody, for their preparation work for site. Uh, and Councillor Hammond, they are part under your portfolio. And please pass on my great appreciation. The site was prepared perfectly. Uh, and just after we planted everything, we had the rain. So um, it was fantastic to see that uh, ground stay wet for a little longer than what we initially expected. So um, many, many thanks, many thanks to the um, to uh, the officers within your portfolio. Uh, we also had the Urala Street Community Garden. Now, um, this is uh, a small initiative that we've started, and I'm sure Councillor Howard will be happy to hear about this. Based on love, food, hate, waste, and it was all about cooking food sustainably from the garden. Uh, we. Bought ourselves, we bought the community garden a small pizza oven and we set the task of actually showing residents and students how to prepare food from the garden and then create these wonderful pizzas. Um, you'll also be happy to know, Councillor Howard, that we had uh, over 28 compost caddies go that morning. Uh, so I'm wondering, we may need another Dalek for the community garden because I think they're going to fill up pretty quick. Uh, we also had um, a local, uh, I'm going to call Karen a celebrity chef uh, because Councillor Maddox does know Karen Brown. He's worked with her in his previous uh, responsibilities within the, the portfolio. Karen came along and showed people how to actually cook the pizzas, to prepare the dough, cut the food up the right way, hand, safe handling of food uh, and that kind of thing. And it was, it was fantastic. We had, we had uh, we had 80 members, my notes tell me we had 80 people come along to learn how to cook straight out of the garden. Um, we also had uh, Kylie Newbury. Now Kylie um, is from our food system and Kylie spoke to those gathered there the importance of sourcing local food and how sourcing food uh, from areas farther than, than normal can be actually be unenvironmental. You have freight costs pollution, that kind of thing, air freight, uh, all those things. And her talk was quite informative and quite inspiring. So I want to thank uh, both Kylie and I want to thank also Karen for their informative presentations. And I also want to thank uh, my staff members, Deb and her assistant, uh, Lucy at the time, who helped um, prepare everything for the day. We had a fantastic day. Uh, it was well received by the community and um, I think at some stage we may see some new pizza chefs emerge from the Urala Street Community Garden. 
Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Chair. Further speakers? Anyone at all? All right, declare the meeting closed.